بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته وعليكم السلام رضا منصور how are you I'm good الحمد لله before we start um, I think there's a, I hear a echo on a, somebody's, yeah. somebody's browser is coming through one of the tabs open yeah I think it's much better now alhamdulillah okay so I have been asked uh, an advice to read out the following disclaimer before we start so I'm going to read so this is a disclaimer it's important for us to understand why um, we need to mention this so the views thoughts and opinions expressed in this program are solely for the purpose of academic intellectual discussion. Pandit Rami, who are, we, we ha have the pleasure of having with us today, is attending today in a personal capacity and leader of his community in Sydney. So this is a personal capacity attendance. Views and opinions expressed are his own and do not in any way reflect those of Dawawais or its representatives. This discuss discussion is for informational and educational purposes only. Should you disagree with anything mentioned or hold an alternate view, you may join the program during the open Q&A to express your points, your concerns, as long as you do, do so with respect and restraint. Alternatively, reach out directly to Pandit Rami via his website in the description that we will provide in, I think, shortly. Um, and what else I need to tell you? Dawawais reserves the right to remove you, our audience, who are seen not to behave with the decorum instantly and possibly ban you from any other future appearance. So with that said, let me welcome everyone to part five of our series on demystifying Hinduism. In this week's stream, we take a deep dive again into the intellectual and philosophical theological underpinnings of Sanatana Dharma with our special guest Pandit Rami, which I will introduce to you very shortly. Unlike previous sessions, there is no presentation today. We will be having a conversational style discussion with Pandit Rami for about an hour or so, and then open up to our audience for question and answers, inshallah. We will cover topic, topics as wide ranging as the concept of God, revealed scripture, acts of worship, the individual man or woman, family, community and society. Naturally, we will touch on topics such as karma, dharma, samsara, moksha, caste and idols. And some of you may have been familiar with these terms as we have already covered a few of these together, but we will go into a deep dive today, inshallah. The de Demystifying de Hinduism series is aim. What exactly is our aim on this uh, series? Is to lay down a foundation of understanding and empathy from which we can reach out to our fellow brothers and sisters in humanity in dialogue and mutual discussion. For many, Islam and Hinduism are two faiths or ways of life that, are, that could not be more distinct. Simplistically, one tradition venerates images while the other shuns them. One worships the cow while the other sacrifices them. One embraces multiple deities while the other accepts only one, the absolute, the unique. Of course, such oversimplifications can be dangerous and disingenuous. They ignore the intellectual diversity, the theology and history of Islam and Hinduism or Sanatan Dharma, which represent almost half of the population of planet Earth. Clearly, this demands a nuanced academic and balanced discussion. We hope the efforts here at Dawa Wise will support that ambition. So I would like to welcome Pandit Rami. Pandit Rami is based in Sydney, also known as Acharya Ram Sivan, ordained as Sri Ram Ramanuja Achari. He was born in South Africa and formally converted to Hinduism at the age of 15. Pandit Rami spent a decade studying Judaism, Christianity and Islam and the three years in India undertaking formal study in yoga, Vedanta philosophy, logic, hermeneutics, Sanskrit and astrology. He has practiced as a Hindu priest and teacher of Yoga Vedanta philosophy for over 40 years. He is a respected and recognized scholar of Hinduism, vested with full rights of initiating others, teaching philosophy and scripture, and conducting all the Hindu ceremonial and sacramental rites. Hello, Pandit Rami. Welcome to our show. Namaste. 
Is that okay if we address you as Pandit Rami, or is there any specific titles uh, we need to um, add that? Um, or you can, you can just call me mate. <laughs> <laughs> and welcome and assalamu alaikum to my uh, fellow co panelists, Brother Muhammad and Brother Hashim. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are we all doing today? Alhamdulillah. It must be very um, early in, in the part of the world where Pandit Rami is joining us. Um, what time is it there at the moment? Uh, Are you... 7.30 is summer's day, bright and warm summer's day. <laughs> in the morning. He's right. just rubbing it in, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, he is rubbing it in. We're sitting in miserable cold, well, UK for me anyway. Uh, right. I'm not sure where the rest of our audience is. But uh, great, great to have you here. Ex exactly. It's a pleasure to have uh, you know some someone with academic uh, scholarship to present and represent uh, the views uh, that we want to understand and elaborate uh, today, inshallah. So it's great uh, to have you here. Why don't we start with getting a know, uh, getting a little bit more about Pandit Rami. Um, we mentioned you converted at the age of 15. What and how did that happen? Do you mind explaining that? Clearly, you were not born into a Hindu family. Well, I was uh, raised in South Africa. And the city in which I lived, Durban, was a majority um, Indian city. Uh, Indian migrants that came to, were brought as indentured laborers, uh, laborers in 1860 uh, by the British. And um, I lived in a mixed area. So the, our whole suburb was mixed. And uh, my family lived in, the, in a house that was just behind the local Hindu temple. So as a child, I was already involved with the temple, with my fr little Hindu friends. We used to play in the temple, we used to go to their festivals and functions. And um, in my teen years, I started attending philosophy classes from uh, one of the visiting swamis that used to come to the temple. And then when I was around 15, I took a formal initiation. So I'd already been involved in Hinduism uh, culturally and religiously from the time I was a child. And uh, my nanny was a Hindu woman and she raised me virtually as a Hindu. So um, it was just in, the, in around the teenage years that I formalized my connection. Um, and for me, uh, my background is uh, Judeo-Christian, obviously, and we, uh, I went to synagogue a few times, went to church a few times. My family were not religious, but they were observant. They, you know, Christmas, Easter, Passover, they used to observe a few things. But my parents were very liberal, and they said, look, whatever, you know, you want to do, you do. And... Um, so it was around about 15 when I decided that I would prefer to follow the uh, Hindu path. To me, it wasn't about rejecting Christianity or Judaism. It was uh, expanding my vision of spirituality to be inclusive. So I can still attend a church ceremony with my Christian relatives. I can still attend a Jewish function with my Jewish relatives. And that doesn't conflict with my uh, core spirituality, which is more inclusive than exclusive. So that's so, where I'm coming from. That's one, so was that important? I mean, I mean, as a 15-year-old, I think that's quite a, a big decision to make, of course. So, so was it something that you deliberated over or was it emotional or, or was, it, was it sort of rational, the choice that you made at the time? I think it was both rational and... Um, um, emotional as well, because it's you feel generally people think emotionally, all of us mm -hmm. as human beings, we think emotionally first, and then afterwards we try and rationalize our emotion, and then we give it structure and con um, you know, sort of academic context. But primarily, our, our reaction, especially in religion, the uh, connection is primarily emotive, and rationality is only secondary to it. Um, so it was both, but um, it was um, what I disliked about both Christianity and Judaism was its uh, inclusive nature. Uh, it's uh, not inclusive, it's exclusivity. So, for example, in the synagogue, when they pray, they say, may the house of Israel experience peace. May the the am um, the ummah of uh, the Jewish ummah experience peace and happiness, etc. 
excluding others. And the same in the church, you pray, may all Christians be happy, may all Christians. And that kind of turned me off because I felt I, I wanted something more inclusive that included the whole of humanity. May all human beings be happy, not only Jews or Christians. And that's where I was going. I found that um, exclusivity and the exclusion of others, I found that to be disagreable. Okay. And I, I found that inclusivity in Hinduism, and that's one of the reasons which attracted me to Interesting. the faith. Uh, I just wanted to know, what is your role in your community right now? I mean, and tell us a bit more about your qualifications, a bit about your background as well. That'll help. Okay, so I um, earning a living as a priest is not uh, it's not financially viable. You can't get a mortgage on a on a priesthood. So I uh, trained to be a nurse. Um, I, I became a registered nurse, and um, I worked in Jerusalem for um, over ten years at a hospital in uh, East Jerusalem. Um, and in the Middle East, I kind of saturated myself in uh, in the Abrahamic because Jerusalem is the centre of uh, the the three Abrahamic faiths. Excuse me while I adjust myself. Um, and when I migrated to Australia forty years ago, um, there were very few Hindus or Muslims in in Australia. There were tiny communities, and um, so I've been working as a nurse, and I still work as a nurse part time. And as a priest on weekends, I perform weddings, cremations, uh, baby blessings, house blessings. Um, so all the and as the Hindu community has grown to over five hundred thousand, so I've become busier over the years with my um, my priestly activities. Right, and in terms of your, um, do you have any formal qualifications in Hinduism? Well, I studied at a, uh, at, in Rishikesh at the Sivananda Ashram, but these are not like Western academic, academic institutes where you get degrees and all that. It's, it's traditional teaching. So you study under traditional gurus and uh, acharyas. Then my final acharya degree I got in South India at a place called Sri Perambadur. And again, that, these are what we would call now as informal studies. They're not kind of academic um, PhD type things. But they, there is the equivalent within the, the uh, traditional uh, education system. Right. But, but this uh, learning under a teacher, which is also something that we recognize within Islam as well, um, is it something where you have to have the right kind of teacher to learn under? Is it somebody who else is also recognized? I mean, you can't just go to anybody. Oh yes, but right. uh, but yeah, uh, but it's not as if they've got like academic or government recognition no, no, understood. Or university. It's within the tradition itself. Yes, so they are authorized, you know, recognized teachers. And so, for example, my uh, my final teacher is very well known in India because he took off the Congress Party and uh, was running cases against them. Mm -hmm. But that's another mm -hmm. long story. So interesting. He's, and and in, in, in this journey of learning that you've had, um, I mean, from the age of 15 to when when did it sort of, let's say, well, what was the pinnacle? Well, where did it sort of finish for you in terms of, okay, I'm now qualified? Or, or well, is it still a process of learning? Uh, well, the whole of life is a process of learning. I mean, every day I'm studying, I'm reading. Um, you know, life is, is one journey of learning. Mm -hmm. But my uh, Acharya degree I obtained about 28 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so from that point, I became what we can say an independent teacher. Because again, within Hinduism, each and every sect is independent from the others. So there's no consensus of scholars. There's no um, you know, manage, management committee. There's no pope. And um, once you are qualified, you are then independent to set up your own school, your own sect, your own uh, you know, center of teaching. And so mm -hmm. it was about at that time that my Acharya said to me, look, you are now independent, go and teach. And then so, I, tell us a little, so, so tell us a little, if you can share with us a little bit about the community in Sydney. Um, you know, what, what are your pastoral activities? What are some of the, you know, how large is it there? How long have you been there? J just to give a sense to the audience of, of really sort of, um, of uh, you know, okay, a bit so of insight. 
the uh, Hindu community, well, the Indian subcontinental community is one of the fastest growing communities in Australia. The migrants are coming mainly from China and India, uh, the subcontinent, India and Pakistan. And so both the Hindu and the Muslim communities are growing at uh, very rapid rates. And we're a um, multicultural Hindu community. We've got Hindus from Nepal, from Mauritius, from South Africa, from Bali, um, obviously from India, Pakistan. And likewise with the Islamic community, there's Muslims from all over the world. So um, my pastoral activities are mainly involved with the different communities, um, getting together, doing workshops. We also have um, established an Australian Council of Hindu clergy because this is a requirement to interface with the government, with the growing community. They recognise that they need to um, address our community issues. And so each of the religious communities has a kind of central council that interacts with the government. So I'm on the uh, interfaith panel. I'm the spokesperson for the Australian Council of Hindu Clergy. And we regularly meet with um, the other religious communities um, and interface with the government. So so does, does that, I mean, let me understand. So does that mean you are influencing or involved in, in policy with the government as well? Yes, indeed. Uh, just one minute, I need to answer the door. Of course. Hello. All right, it's already okay. been, what, 16 yeah, we'll, minutes? Yeah. We'll, I think, we'll uh, back to yeah. We'll, we'll dive into the actual topic now. <laughs> yes, exactly. Fantastic. Yeah, so right, let's, just kind of, uh, okay, let's just close out that. So you are involved in policy and influencing government um at least recommendations uh, for your community? Yes, or is it, in, community, in or is it a larger of, community across Australia? Uh, well, it involves the whole community, and it's like, for example, uh, uh, cremation uh, rights. That was our big thing. You know, how to, um, you know, educate the funeral directors, crematoriums about requirements for our cremation mm -hmm. procedures. Um, we advise government on visa policy for religious workers. And um, we also liaise with the, uh, the Islamic leaders about, again, on visa categories, what kind of people should be allowed in, you know, what are the criteria for religious workers. So we kind of cooperate and coordinate on those type of things. Fantastic. Fantastic. Wonderful. Interesting. I think it'll be a good time now, perhaps, to dive into the actual topic. Yes. Um, so, uh, so Pandit Rami, if we were to ask you, um, like, what makes a person Hindu? How would you respond? Well, that's a very interesting one. Um, the best way to do it, um, the best way to answer that, it's all about obligation. And the obligation is gratitude. And for us, the worst sin of all is the sin of ingratitude. So as human beings, we are born with five debts. Debt to our parents, debt to God, debt to society, uh, debt to the environment, and uh, debt to ancestors. So these are our five debts. And as Hindus, we our entire life consists of discharging those debts. So the debt to our parents is to honor them, respect them, care for them in their old age. Uh, debt to God is to um, worship. But worship is a tricky one because it's not the same as ibadah. Worship for us is puja, which is making offerings. That is how we demonstrate our uh, respect or debt to God is through making offerings, not through actually praying for stuff. So that's ibadah and puja are kind of, they translated the same, but they mean different things. Um, and debt to the ancestors is to honor them by periodic uh, rituals. Once a year we do memorial services for the ancestors and to beget offspring. Um, I said, okay, there, there's a debt to the rishis, the sages, which is done through study and teaching. Debt to humanity is through hospitality and caring for others. Debt to the environment is through um, obviously caring for the environment, green policies, and I'm not saying that this is actually practiced. The vast majority of Hindus do not do these things. 
but uh, this is the theory of what it means to be a Hindu. It's I'm discharging my debt to my parents, my ancestors, to my uh, rishis, to God, to the environment and to society. So okay. all of this done without necessarily having a, a belief, a theistic belief per se. Okay. So is there any, when you say obligation, I mean, is there any, what do you say, set of rules which you go by in order to say whether your obligation has been met or not? There are different levels of practice. So there is the formal level of practice where you do follow rules and regulations and then allowances made for others who do not have the knowledge or the education to follow rules and regulations and they can make it up as they go along. But um, the, as long as the sentiment is the same, it doesn't matter what exactly you do in terms of the structure of your practice. So this is How why you, that, yeah, sorry. This sorry, is why you get sorry, some sorry. variations within Hindu practice. You see some people do one thing, some people do another thing. Why do they do that? And also the rules and regulations are different for different sects. Hmm. And... Uh, this is why Hinduism is an umbrella term for many different religions, sects, practices. So I'm talking from a general perspective. I'm not talking about any specific sect or other, and they all have their differences. So on and this note, on this note, go ahead. Yeah. is this based uh, the principles or obligations that you just mentioned, are they based on scriptural um, you know, some some references where Correct. this is what o every Hindu knows about these things from reading the scripture and they're agreed upon? <laughs> you touched on an interesting subject. Hindus generally don't read scriptures. <laughs> this is their problem. But uh, these, what we call them as um, Mahayagyas or Maharanas are found in the Vedas. But they are mentioned, they are not detailed. They're saying that this, these are your obligations to your parents, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so it's detailed. Then it's later on the Acharyas and the Rishis, they decided, okay, let's put this into a structure. And so we'll say that these are the obligations. So we've got some general um, guidelines, but the specifics are up to the individual to figure out for themselves. Okay, so you're saying they are and descriptive and not prescriptive? Correct. Okay. That's yeah. a nice way of putting uh, well, it. Well, let me just come in there. So, so you, I know you you said a past every, but when you say they don't read or they they don't they don't, what, what exactly do you mean by that? I mean, is it is it there is no formal mechanism for teaching, or or is it this that it, it used to be, but it's no longer the case? There, there is no formal um, rec there's no formal teaching of scripture, but. It's also important to know at this, um, introduce at this perspective, what um, what are the sources of truth mm -hmm. in uh, Hinduism? So Hinduism epistemology um, posits there are three sources of valid knowledge. So the first is empiricism, observation, uh, five senses. This is how we get information from the external world. The second is um, rational thinking, reasoning, critical thinking. And the third is scripture. So the first thing, um, my illustration is always uh, uh, NIC, what's that program? NICS. That's a, um, so you find a dead body and then the team arrives. The first thing they do is they collect evidence. They collect the evidence and they go back to the police station and they start working out timelines, um, uh, possible motives and all that. And then thirdly, they invite the witnesses in. So in the same way, in life, we deal, first of all, our truth comes through our sense, perception and observation, scientific method, and then rationalization, critical thinking, reasoning. And if that doesn't work for us, then we turn to scripture. But the emphasis in uh, scriptural studies is that scripture cannot contradict evidence and reason. This is very important. So if scripture does contradict evidence and reason, that part of the scripture is rejected. So for us, uh, cherry picking is essential. So if the scripture says, for example, that the world sits on the back of a tortoise that um, is held up by eight elephants, that's obviously nonsense. So we reject that because it, does, it doesn't uh, 
confirm reality. So scripture has to go along with observation and uh, critical thinking. And so in general so, terms, so sorry, Pandit. So, so in general terms, is this something that all Hindus agree to, or is this something that only your sect does? No, the scholars, all Hindu scholars, like for all example, do this. Okay. Yeah. So, for example, uh, when you talk about Vedanta, which is the core philosophy of Hinduism, there are three great acharyas that are recognized by everyone: Shankara Acharya, Ramanuja Acharya, and Madhva Acharya. And all three have pointed this out, that if scripture says that fire is cold, the scripture has to be rejected. That's, the, that's actually the phrase they use, that the okay. scripture cannot contradict reality. Now, you know, Shankara, Ramuna, and Madhva, I mean, the, these are, what, these are um, more sort of, just for the audience here, these are what you would be your equivalent of... Um, the closest you have to prophets almost, right? Or, or, yeah. this, or, 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 or what? I mean, how would you describe them? What are they? Not really, because a prophet is an emissary, a messenger sent by God. Right. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. That's the technical firm uh, yes. uh, anal um, description of what a prophet is. It's a messenger. Whereas these acharyas are people, human beings that have studied, and all of them had their previous gurus as well. They have gone and studied the scriptures and had their own personal realizations. Now, this is also a very important point that um, another form of, I said there are three sources of knowledge, um, empiricism, reason, scripture, and the fourth so uh, source we call as yogi pratyaksha, which is realizations in deep states of meditation. So oh. that all of these three had realizations in deep states of meditation. But we don't categorize them as official sources of knowledge because they cannot be proven. They're based on a personal experience. So I can say I met God and I spoke to God. That is my personal experience. I cannot convince you of that. So therefore, it's not really a valid form of convincing others. But if, if your personal experience supports um, evidence, scripture, um, the whole, you know, ethos of the religion, and then we accept it as valid. And what is it about these three individuals that that sort of really made them so influential? What is it they did that they did, or contribute well, to, Shankar, to your faith? If you look at Shankaracharya, was in the what eighth, ninth century, um, and he was the greatest of um, the philosophers of Vedanta. And he was a monist or a non-dualist. Uh, we can come back to dualism, non-dualism later. Yeah. So he was a non-dualist and um, he was the, the founder of modern Hinduism, really, because he's uh, established 10 monastic orders. And these 10 monastic orders then became the teachers of all um, Hindus. Ramanuja lived in about the 11th century and he objected. He was a personalist uh, theologian who was deeply uh, a monotheist and uh, completely a personalist. For him, God was a personal, loving being. Whereas for Shankaracharya, God was an abstract, unknowable, unseen, formless uh, being. Um, and he came up with a form of Vedanta known as qualified non dualism. Mm -hmm. which says that, um, uh, to simplify it, uh, Shankaracharya said the world and God and the individual souls are one thing, that we say monism. So there's no duality, there's just one thing. Uh, Ramanuja was qualified non-duality where he said God, the souls and the world are three different things, but they form one composite being. Whereas Madhva Acharya was in about the 12th or 13th century, and there is uh, a belief that he was influenced uh, by Christianity and Islam, and he came up with a radical dualism, which said that God's souls in the world are completely different. Um, so, that's, that's, that's interesting. So what this says to me is you have, you have, you have almost there three separate um, theistic traditions, but correct. you're saying... As far as you're concerned, there is nothing heretical about any of these. No. And why is that? 
the the largest uh, philosophical sect is the Advaita, the non-duality system of Shankaracharya. That is the dominant role of Hindu philosophy. Mm -hmm. The uh, qualified non-dualists are the next um, largest group, but the dualists, uh, Madhvacharya, are the smallest group and they're rather insignificant. The other two schools um, re reject their... The thing is that there's no such thing as heresy within Hinduism, but what we have is the schools debate amongst themselves and refute each other's arguments. So there's intensive internal debate between these three schools of Hindu philosophy. And there is like, for example, um, the uh, uh, qualified non-dual school, one of the scholars in about the 16th or 17th century wrote 100 defects of the, the non-dual philosophy. And then a scholar from the non-dual philosophy wrote another work known as Shatabhushani, the 100 ornaments of the non-dual philosophy. So they, it's come to a point where it's stalemate. We're okay. all on the chessboard, but we're not going anywhere. Fantastic. But we're all so, Let's take it back up a level then, because I think this is a good point to introduce, I think, some foundational principles then in that case. Yeah. Sorry, before um, we do that, uh, Brother Muhammad, oh, I just oh, wanted course, to yes, say no. salam alaykum yes. to Brother Adnan Rashid. Salam alaykum, Brother Adnan. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is Pandit Rami uh, Adnan, bhai. So... Uh, we're just having a conversation, nice so I um, <laughs> hope you got your coffee with you. We can, we're just having a co little coffee chat around the table here. Um, okay. Okay. So this is actually a great point for us. I mean, just just so we can draw a, a at least a, at least sort of parallel. Um, let's start with with sort of the highest level of the concept of transcendence or God. Then, in that case, um, and we'll get to the sort of the 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 proliferation. Of, of worship that we, that we we sort of I guess know as a as an outside in perspective. So, when we look at the concept of God, what is it from your perspective that all Hindus can agree on, and what is it that that sort of makes them different because we see different practices in reality? Okay, so um, as I said before, according to Hindu epistemology, there are three sources of knowledge: empiricism, mm -hmm. reason, and scripture. Now, the nature of God cannot be determined by um, evidence or reason. So there's, from our point of view, there's absolutely no evidence that God exists. And your reason can only take you so far, but no further. So where we learn about God is through the medium of scripture. And in this case, it's Veda. So in the Veda, it describes God as having five qualifying properties or characteristics. And these are known as Sat, Chit, Ananda, Amala, and Ananta. So Sat means being, Chit means consciousness, Ananda means bliss. Amala is freedom from every form of conceivable imperfection. And Ananta means whatever you say about God is, has no end. It's immeasurable. It is in, infinite. So if you say God is compassionate, it means infinite compassion. There can be no limit to that compassion. If you say that God is ananda or love, there can be no limit to that love or compassion. So, so, so the, we would sorry. So we would say, for example, God is all knowledgeable or all wise. Yes, omniscient. So you would say wisdom and knowledge are uh, infinite yeah. in, in your perspective as well. So, right? I mean, uh, going into Christian theology or Western theology, they say God is omniscient. Absolutely, He is all knowing. Mm -hmm. God is um, omnipotent. He is all-powerful. God is om uh, omnipresent. He is everywhere and in everything. Pervade. And so we take, there, there may be a discrepancy here in some Islamic um, views on... Well, certainly on omnipresence, we would disagree, of course. I mean, th yes, th there is yeah, exactly. clearly no... no yeah, it, it sounds pretty much there. like you're describing the attributes of Allah in most cases. Yeah. I mean... Absolutely. Uh, Again, with, even within the Quran, there's a, a verse which says, wherever you uh, look, you'll see Allah. I can't remember the exact reference, but I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. Brother is, if you turn the face reference. east or west, yes, yeah, the face of Allah is there, yeah. something like that. Yeah. This yeah. was during yeah. the change of the Qibla, I believe. So anyway, I think, you know, before we describe uh, what's in the Vedas, I really would like to know um, 
you, you said that we cannot know God by reason, we cannot know God to, um, yeah, through, evidence. Through, through evidence and so on. Um, but we can know him through Vedas. I believe that was uh, that is what yes. you were. Tr- I to. think I think we 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 agree yeah. with uh, what uh, what Pandit Ji has said so far. Apart from uh, a couple of things, for example, evidence. He said that uh, we can only know God from the Scripture, not through the evidence or reasoning. Reasoning uh, only so much. Um, but when it comes to uh, our Islamic perspective, our scholars and our uh, let's say saints have taught us that God has revealed two um, two types of information or revelation, if you like. One is the universe, and the other one is scripture. So when you look at the universe, you see the evidence for God's creation. You see uh, a grand scheme. You see the signs of the Creator. You see the sun and the moon. They are mathematically placed, right? They are very powerfully put. The sun is an immense ball of burning fire, which is emitting gases and radiations equivalent to approximately 200 billion atomic bombs, bombs, one of those flares. So it's immense power contained within a giant ball, let's call it a star, and placed exactly right for our life to exist, our life to uh, continue on this tiny planet called planet Earth, which is like a speck in the grand scheme of things. So looking at all these things, uh, we we call it we call it the evidence for God. Uh, I mean, we philosophically we have different names. For example, we have teleological argument, which is fine tuning argument, which points to a grand schema, a grand creator or a maker. So we see these as evidences. Uh, in 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 fact, these are empirical evidences for the existence of a great um, designer, sustainer, or maker, for that matter. So that's where we, I, I think, slightly disagree that that, that Pandeji is saying that there is no evidence, uh, but there is evidence if we look closely, and it is in the universe. And of course, the scripture, the scripture has been revealed, and we can read about this creator in the scripture and his qualities and his characteristics. So, and as to what he wants from us, right? So uh, we know what he wants from us is through his scriptures. So just wanted to quickly hmm. highlight that. Uh, no, that's a good point. You. What I would add there as well is I think logic can get you, I mean, once you appreciate the creation, then logic can at least get you to recognizing that there is a beginning to all of this, that mm. it started, mm. and this started, it must have a first cause. I think we mm. can we can all agree that we can get to that, at least logically. Then the question arises, the nature of this cause, what is it? And this is where I think you were, I mean, all of the attributes you described earlier in terms of, 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 uh, we don't say infinite, we say the source of all knowledge, the source of all power, the source of all all love, the source of, you know, and we have more than 99 attributes that are, that are mentioned in our traditions in the Quran. So all of these attributes are, we, we say, the source of, and they're mentioned repeatedly almost at the end of every verse in the Quran. So I think on those we can agree, at least. Um, not on the omnipresence piece, though. But uh, yeah. but yeah, carry on. So yeah, let, us, let us go back yeah. to the Pandit. I think he may yeah. want to explain a bit further in terms of what he actually meant. I mean, I, I, what yeah, I understood yeah. is there are some <laughs> limitations of using observation and reason. Yes. I think that's what he was pointing to, rather than not any utility for it. Uh, carry on, well, Pandit Ran. The, the, uh, Mansur is very insightful. The uh, the argument. I mean, I've I've heard all the Christian and uh, the, the Abrahamic arguments, and it's all based on the Kalam uh, argument for creation. There must be a. Um, the Hindu philosophers would reject that because the, the, first of all, the concept of time is different. Uh, in yes. the a- Abrahamic view, it's linear, uh, whereas in the Oriental view, it's um, it's cyclical. So we do not believe that the creation had a beginning. It is a circle. And on a point of a, on a circle, there is no beginning, there is no end. There is just simply process. So we would not say the world was ever created. The world is a process of continual becoming. So there's no beginning, no end. It's just moving through cycles. I mean, I pre- this is another argument, you know, the uh, proof um, for the evidence of God is a complex issue. I don't want to go into that right now because that could be a um, argument in itself. But um, I, I know that the, the Islamic position on that and our position is uh, is obviously different. But um, 
Okay. Uh, from our perspective, we say you cannot, in order to prove a connection, there must be an invariable connection between them. And the example used is of smoke in a mountain. So when you look at smoke in a mountain, you can infer that there's a fire. Why? Because you know that there is an invariable connection between smoke and fire. But when you see um, stars, suns are being created every moment a star is being born, we do not see anybody creating that star. It comes into being. Now, we can infer, we can say, oh, there must be a creator. But what, then we would argue, why should there be a creator? Why can it not come into being of itself? And then, you know, so these arguments are there. And what we say is that those arguments cannot, are not sufficient to prove the existence or the name. They may prove that there is a cause, but it doesn't tell us anything about that cause. In order to know about God, you have to go to the, the scriptures and find out what are the qualities of God. So you cannot logically assume that God is consciousness, compassion, kindness, or powerful. None of this can you infer from that. All you can say is there was a cause. Yeah, I think you're, you're right. With regards to the details about the attributes of God, obviously yeah. only God knows who, and he can only inform us. So there's a reason earlier I wanted to ask you with regards to the source of the Vedas. What do you, uh, how, what do you believe um, or where do you believe the Vedas came from? Were, were they Are they similar to uh, what the Abrahamic faith believed that they were before, before we get to Vedas, I, I just would like to. No, add I want to something. know the source, uh, Adnan Bhai. So, because yes. for for, for uh, Panditji, no, I, I, I just wanted yeah. to quickly point out uh, uh, something uh, Panditji has highlighted that it is not possible to get attributes of God from simply looking at the creation, but it is possible to look at uh, the creation and find some of the attributes of God. For example, uh, I gave you the example earlier of the solar system. It's not only uh, the cause we are concerned with, it is the, the attributes of the cause. Uh, what is this cause uh, capable of is the question here. For example, the solar system is finely tuned and in order to tune it to this extent, uh, one has to be immensely wise and knowledgeable. Okay, so what do we get from the solar system? Because it's so finely tuned, we get the idea that the maker, the designer or the sustainer is immensely wise and knowledgeable because without math mathematical cal uh, calculations, without being able to calculate the distance and the width and the length of um, all the uh, objects within the solar system, one cannot create the solar system. So mathematical knowledge, which uh, uh, comes from wisdom and, uh, and being able to know um, so, so this is a very strong indication of an attribute God uh, contains, and that is knowledge. The other uh, attribute we can, uh, you know, uh, be easily um, come uh, come up uh, come up with is um, power. God is immensely powerful because in order to place uh, a star like the sun, in, which which has immense energy in it, as I described earlier. Uh, you know, this God has to be very powerful or the, the one who placed the sun in its current constant has to be immensely powerful without immense power, without being able to do it. One cannot do it. So at least two attributes come out from the solar system alone. And if we start talking about other things in the universe, OK, we see compassion, we see mercy, we see order. All these things can be uh, deducted. Uh, from uh, the evidence we see in the universe. So I would uh, disagree with Panditji on this, that by looking at the universe, you cannot get the attributes of God. We can. Uh, in fact, we can. And uh, even Revelation points to it. So now coming to the point of Hashim, that how do we know where Vedas come from? What are the sources? Uh, how do we know they're even divine in the first place? Yeah, we yeah. can go yeah. into this just to um, yeah. Yeah. consolidate what you've said. So... Um, when we talk about how much we can use our reason and observation, I mean, reason, um, and Panditji is very well known um, on these issues very well anyway. He has studied this, uh, you know, uh, in, in depth. Even though with such limitations, there are things that reason and observation can point to with some certainty. One is the, the knowledge of God, as you've highlighted, um, Usadanan, and the power or energy, being possessor of power and energy. 
The other important thing is also of intent or will. Um, has to be conscious, self-aware, and with the power of choice or intent. These things are reason and observation illustrates it, and, and I don't think we need just to read a scripture to verify these things. This will be something that we can agree on on, on, on this epistemological grounds. So it's, it's deductive reasoning, basically. And this is yeah. part of the epistemology yeah. which um, you, you're aware of, I think, Pandit yeah. But we want to know, why do Pandit Rami think that um, these are not possible to know through observation and reason? Well, first of all, we have a... Uh, I mean, again, we now going into a really complex com uh, conversation, which uh, it's a bit, you know, we're deviating from the topic. But um, the uh, problem with creation, there is a problem because the world is matter. How does an unseen, invisible God create a world of matter? What did he create the world from? Did he create the world from nothing? Or was matter pre-existent and he formulated the the cosmos meaning the order of the cosmos through pre-existence matter now if you go back to the torah the torah does not say that god created the world from nothing it said that there was chaos and yahweh established order within that chaos now there's a big question for both abrahamic theologians and for us is what is the connection between the creator and the created? Did the world, where did the atoms, we know the world is uh, energy, it's matter, quantum matter. Where did that quantum matter come from? How did an unseen spirit being create that? <clears throat> so this is where, you know, you're going into really, um, so you, we don't believe in creation per se. We call it as srishti. Srishti means a projection into being. So we would say God did not create the world, God projected the world. And the example that is used is, is called Urna Nabi Nyaya. It's like a spider. A spider creates a web and it lives in the middle of the web. Where does it get its stuff from? It doesn't go down to you know, the hardware store and get uh, bits of timber and create its web. It projects the, the web from within itself. So we use that as a similitude for the way that God has created the world by projecting matter from within himself. So the world, the matter, the energy of the world is in actual fact an aspect of God himself. So just to clarify Pandit Rami here, so there is no creation then because creation and the creator, these are two distinct forms or distinct concepts creation itself would be distinct from the creator the moment the creation is initiated originated or brought about but in your in your view as you expounding there is no separation from the creator of the creation creation has never been separated it's always god, been correct yeah. god i mean this view in uh, theology is called panentheism where God is not only manifests the world, but he is also beyond and transcendent to the world. Pantheism is identifying the world with God, whereas panentheism is saying that God is the material world and beyond. So the similitude that we use within Vedanta philosophy is our body. You have a physical body, but you also have a soul. Now, the two are different, but they work together as one. So you manifest, so what comes first, your soul or your body? So again, this is another theological argument, but we would say that the soul comes first and the soul projects the body. So the, the external you is a projection of the inner essence of who you actually are. So in the same way, this uh, universe of two trillion galaxies and billions and billions of suns and planets is all the projection of God. And because we don't accept a linear time frame, creation cannot exist because there is always just transformation. So we believe in a pulsating universe. So if you take the example of the Big Bang, the Big Bang happened at a point in time, but it was not the very first Big Bang. It was the residue of the previous creation. Um, uh, it's like a seed from a tree, right? So the seed of the banyan tree the seed is planted, the banyan tree grows, drops a seed, another banyan tree comes. So that is the pulsating universe model that we work with. 
And yeah, so well, I mean, Roger Penrose speaks, I mean, Hawking uh, sort of developed models like this, yeah. um, sort of contracting, expanding universe. Um, and I think, yeah, okay, look, um, that's your perspective. That's interesting. So, but if I was to summarize, what you're essentially saying is this projection then, uh, and I'm, 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 I'm understanding it, is it yeah. means then that reality, as far as we can see from your perspective, is illusory. It's an illusion. It's not real then in that case. Correct. Because if it is a, if it is a projection, it's not yeah. real in the way that we see creation. Correct. And now, if you say God created the world from nothing, it is also an illusion, because from nothing, nothing comes. So you're still coming back to the same problem of what is the nature of the world? Is it real or not unreal? But so it, it's not nothing, well, Panditji. For example, if we say that God created something. Yes. Why do you think, just why are you trying to anthropomorphize God by saying that in order for us to create something, we need some sort of a raw material? You Correct. cannot, Dan, say the same thing with regards to the Almighty God, who you earlier said we cannot even understand with our reasoning. Correct. So what are you doing okay. is you're using your human faculties in order to understand God, but then putting the limitation of our, uh, what do you say, of the creation. So, for example, if God created something, Yes, um, his power, his energy, or whatever you want to call it, I wouldn't say that is nothing. Okay, that is something we don't understand. So I wouldn't say yeah, God that... creates from nothing, or God yeah. is nothing. God is everything. I think for 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 a person like you as a panentheist. So so what what we what we believe in is basically I, I'm not too sure about ex nihilo, creatio. Ex nihilo, I don't know if that's uh, strictly speaking an Islamic principle or Islamic belief, but what we do believe in is that God has the creating power which is possessed by him. And when he wants a matter to be, he simply says, be and it becomes. Yeah. As the Quran clearly states, that when he wants a matter to be, he simply says, be and it becomes. Just like that, the universe came about. Uh, what people call the Big Bang, I mean, we, we're not even sure about the Big Bang. Big, Big Bang has 22 models. And uh, if we start arguing for Big Bang, then we might have to choose a model which we cannot. We don't know which particular model is accurate and is correct. But what we can say that God caused all of this. Okay, it was caused by God. And philosophically speaking, when we go back, when we argue for the existence of God, uh, it, it all boils down to the first cause. Okay, if all of this has a beginning, then the one who made it cannot have a beginning. The one who made all of this has to be static in his existence. He has always existed, and he's the one who initiated what we know as the universe. Whether yeah. it's two, whether it's two hundred trillion galaxies or whether it's two billion galaxies, it makes no it makes no difference. All of this was initiated by one entity who has the power to initiate all of this. And that's good. Yeah. 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 So, to clarify, or, or even multiverses, or even multiverses, just, right? Yeah, yeah. At the end of the day, it, whatever theory you come up with, what it boils yeah. down to is, is the world of beginning. Yeah, carry on. I want to clarify something up on it here. So you, you highlight, um, interestingly, of course, uh, in philosophy, the, this has been the question. I mean, how do you get something from nothing? The creation ex nihilo concept. But Islamically, if you were to analyze our scripture, the Quran, you'd notice that as Ustaz Adnan Rashid is talking about, every time when God creates something, his creative word, he uses the word to create. Now, what his word contains in terms of creative power is something that we may not fathom, but definitely it's not happening from nothingness. It's happening through his word, the power within the word that transforms into reality. So That's I don't think one, in that yeah. perspective, we don't believe in creation ex nihilo, rather... Uh, when God wants to create anything, his creative word, I mean, in Arabic, it's iskun, of course, that transforms into reality, whatever manifestation it's going to uh, present itself in. I mean, these ideas also have their resonance in uh, Hindu philosophy. We talk about the world as being shabda. Shabda means voice, sound. And mm -hmm. we also claim that the entire universe is based on sound. <clears throat> and Om is the sound, the primeval sound from which creation emanates. 
So these, uh, the idea of creation through sound is not unique to uh, Torah or Quran. It's also found in the Vedas as well. So these are similar concepts. It's just, uh, I don't see that we're talking about different things. I'm no. think, talking about the same thing in different perspectives. But we, uh, we can agree on there being a source, um, omniscience, um, omnipotence, sound, all of this we can agree on. These are not points of conflict. We there, is, there, is a lot of, there is a lot of overlap, no doubt, the things you have mentioned. Uh, a lot of those things are actually clearly stated in the Quran. And some of these are Islamic principles. Uh, a lot of things you have mentioned, of course, with some exceptions. Where we, do it, where we do it disagree. And a lot of these similarities, by the way, have been seen between Islam and Hinduism or Hindu philosophy for that matter before us. I don't know if you are aware of Dara Shikoh. Uh, uh, yes, that's that, mentioned, yes. Yeah, he translated the Upanishads into Persian. Yeah, Dara Shiku, yeah, he, he, he did translate uh, Upanishads in Persian. And he also authored another book titled Majmal Bahrain. Majmal yeah. Bahrain actually means the meeting of the two seas mm -hmm. the meeting of the two seas what he was uh, islam and hindu philosophy so he was of the opinion that the source of hindu philosophy ultimately and the source of the quran ultimately is the same basically mm -hmm. right so this was his view that there are a lot of similarities a lot of overlaps uh, um, between hinduism and uh, and uh, islam or hindu philosophy for that matter and, and we have no problem in even, um, even let's say, assuming that some of the teachings in the Vedas may have originally come from prophets in India uh, in prehistoric times. Because we are told in the Quran that, uh, that, that Allah sent prophets to every nation and India is no exception. I'm pretty sure uh, prophets might have come to India and they might have taught principles that may have survived in an altered form, possibly in a corrupted form in the teachings of the sages who wrote uh, Vedas, or maybe these sages got the inspiration from some prophetic tradition that had been altered and changed. Uh, we, we cannot claim to have uh, exactly what those authors might have written or conveyed to their future uh, audiences, but it is very plausible that there were prophets in India and they might have taught these principles originally revealed by God in their respective languages to their respective people and later on these teachings might have survived in some form in uh, uh, Vedas uh, with other things of course with other teachings and philosophies like the Bible uh, what we believe about the Bible the biblical text which is possessed by the Jews and the Christians today is that there is truth in there which originally comes from prophetic traditions revealed by God Almighty, and then there are uh, additions, interpolations, and uh, uh, ideas added by later authors. So why why can't we accept that for the Vedas, uh, if, if if there is some information so that... So let's, to this and so let's ask um, Pandit Rami on this case now here. When we talk about scripture, please, um, would you mind explain to us in terms of the scripture itself, the Vedas, how they originated, transmitted, and preserved so our audience have a broader understanding of you know what actually you believe about the scriptures and how much central role it plays in ascertaining and being certain about the divine through the knowledge from the scripture because I, the point i want to make is this philosophically of course the finite can never fathom and comprehend the infinite it is not accessible for, for the finite to know the infinite so the, when the infinite transmits or reveals in our language in, in, in Islamic theology, when the infinite, the, the divine, reveals this knowledge, then we are able to understand the reality of the infinite. So if Vedas are such uh, divinely inspired or revealed knowledge, I mean, what are your views? I mean, I think not many people understand exactly what the Vedas really uh, mean uh, to Hindu uh, people in, in their belief system. Okay, so Veda literally means knowledge. That's the meaning of the term. Veda means knowledge. Um, there are 360 rishis, and amongst those rishis, there were 28 rishikas, which are female rishis. And they composed poems and hymns based on their deep insights into the nature of reality. 
so the uh the 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 form it the closest you can get in an islamic analogy would be the zubur the hymns of the psalms of david so the veda is in the form of psalms of hymns of praise within those hymns there is embedded philosophical and theological information within those poems so they it was the insight of the rishi so we don't believe in prophets that are being sent it's rather the knowledge god is within us and god is in our deepest essence so by going within through the process of meditation we can realize these truths for ourselves within ourselves and that is where we meet god in our own very own hearts so we don't need external prophets to de deliver us messages because the same truth we all and we do believe that all the mystics of every nation christian kabbalah um, sufi whatever it is all of us in our meditation come to the same realizations and these are the eternal truths that are taught in the veda so um, the again there's a lot of contradiction within the vedas the different rishis 560 different rishis they have conflicting opinions about certain things so the Vedas again are divided into four sections, Samhita, Brahmana, Ranyaka, and Upanishads. The Upanishads are the final portions of the Vedas, which are discourses and dialogues between teachers and their students. And that is why it's called Veda Anta. Anta means end, Veda Anta means the end of the Vedas. The culmination of the Vedic teaching is found in the Upanishads. So in order to find our theological stuff and philosophy, we don't go to the hymns. We rather go to the discourses in the Veda, which are the, uh, the final portions. And in those final portions, we have everything that we need to construct our theology and philosophy. So the, let me sort of understand this then. So because there are a couple of things I think uh, would be worth clarifying. First of all, the Vedas, as far as I know, you've got four primary ones, the Rig Veda, the Sama Veda, the Yajur Veda, and Atar Veda. Atar Veda um, is disputed. <laughs> uh, okay, no, I, yeah, exactly. And I, I don't want to get into the, those set of yeah. issues, but I'll say broadly, this is what I, 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 I said. Okay. Now, what you're, what you're indicating is then Upanishads were derived from those Vedas. Correct. Or, or, or in some way related based on Correct. contemplation, thinking, and deep thought. Correct. So, in a way, it is it is sort of man's opinion of of how they should be interpreted. So, I have a question before this, which is, what is the source of the Veda then? Where did that? Act, I mean, was it revealed scripture in the in the way that we, for example, our tradition says, you know, Gabriel, angel Gabriel, Jibril Islam came mm -hmm. and revealed the Quranic revelation. Directly to Prophet yeah. Muhammad, who then immediately memorized it, and his um, his um, disciples, people around him, they wrote it down as well at the same time. Yeah. So we have a preserved text, which is memorized and written down, and we can trace it all the way back to the origin. Is there a similar thing for the Veda? Well, the Vedas were always taught by word of mouth and transmitted by memory. So even today, students that study the Vedas learn the entire text by heart. And not only do they learn it by heart, they learn it in eight different methods of computation. So um, it's they call Vikriti recitations, where the text is jumbled up into eight different ways in order to um, ensure that it's transmitted perfectly. And uh, we have an un, uh, a recorded history of over 5,000 years of transmission of the Vedas in exactly the same way. And um, so some would say they are revelations of God. There is this um, school of thought within Hinduism. Um, I am more of the rationalist school of thought, which say that don't believe that God per se revealed them. They, they intuited the teachings through their own um, connection with God as mystics. Do do the Vedas make the claim anywhere that they are revealed or, or they're no, from God? Not really. It doesn't. Okay. No. Okay. Because the Quran know. does. I mean, the Quran does. The Quran yeah. makes a direct claim that it is directly revealed from God. Yeah. Yeah. You see, this is where the difference is. The Quran makes that direct claim that this book is from God, your creator. 
And not mm-hmm. only that, Quran also states that if this book was from another source than God, then there would have been many discrepancies or contradictions in it. You you mentioned earlier, Panditji, that there are contradictions in the Vedas. And contradictions usually highlight uh, a number of sources, not one source in particular. Because if this if there is one source ultimately of this information, then there wouldn't be contradictions, right? Uh, especially if God is the source. So clearly God is not the source of the Vedas if there are contradictions. If there is different information coming from different rishis, teaching different things, uh, often contradicting each other, then clearly God is not the source of these Vedas, right? Would I be right in assumi- assuming that? Uh, this is what I basically said, that we intuit in meditation, you go within, and I believe that God, re- well, we believe that God reveals himself to the individual within the depth of your own being. You meet God within yourself in meditation and God communicates, not verbally, obviously, but through your intuition. This is why I said originally in the Hindu epistemology, Yogi Pratyaksha. Yogi Mm -hmm. Pratyaksha is internal insight, uh, but that internal insight cannot contradict reason and empiricism. So you have to test your perceptions and your realizations using reason. Um, I mean, I'm aware of the differences in uh, the nature of the Quran, but and that there are, you know, arguments against the uh, perfection of the Quran, that there are you know, hundreds of videos you can find online where be even uh, in uh, Hassan Radwan, one of your guys in England, he's written story, uh, you know, given uh, videos about how he finds the, the, the discrepancies within the Quran. I don't want to go into that argument because a lot of that is based on faith. He's not it's, a Muslim. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just for the audience, Hassan Ridwan is not a Muslim. No, no, he, he no. was. Yeah, he's he, was. Was. Um, he was. He yeah. was. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. We, we wouldn't so, take information from an ex Hindu and we don't no, take information from ex Muslim. No, we don't want to go into that. Yeah, let's not go into that. Let me sort of finish the th- let me sort of finish the thought here though, because I really want to sort of underline some of this. So yeah. First of all, I think, let me just sort of underline. For, so based on your rationalist perspective, you're saying, look, I, I don't yeah. think they're, they're revealed from God, but they're sort of revealed from within. And to yeah. the point that Brother Adnan just made, which is then this clearly means that depending on my contemplation versus your contemplation, we could arrive at different conclusions. So ah, who, says, who, who, decides, can... who, who decides who's right? Ra- rationality, critical thinking, reason, and debate. Now, you see, coming back to um, uh, Brother Adnan earlier on said that looking at the cosmos, we can get the uh, understanding of the qualities of God. We would say, don't look at the cosmos, go within your own self and analyze what is common to all living beings. What is our commonality? So we would say that there are three commonalities that all living beings have. First is asti, being. We all are. There's no argument that we, we exist. Are. Okay, so we exist. Being. Mm-hmm. A consciousness. We are all sentient beings. Even animals are sentient beings. And the third quality is priti. Priti means love. Every living being has a certain degree of love. Even a, a um, no matter, an animal has a certain degree of love and affection. Now, that, those are three qualities which all of us, all sentient beings, us and animals, sentient beings, I'm including animals as well, share those three in, in common. And then from that, we can infer that the, that the Lord of the universe, who is the greatest of the great, right, Akbar, do you agree with that? Hello, Akbar. Um, so the Lord of the universe must also possess these three, but in a superlative degree. So therefore, we go to being. God is being par excellence. Everything you know in the universe is uh, is being God's being. Consciousness. God is consciousness, defined as consciousness, and we, our consciousness, is a moiety or spark of that divine illumination. <clears throat> Again, we have an overlap. We call it Jyoti Sham Jyoti Hi, Nur Al Anwar. So God is the light of all lights, and we are sparks within that light. So that is our consciousness. Then Preeti, all of us have love. 
to a certain degree, some more, some less. But God must be love beyond anything that you can conceive of. And that is we call as ananda. So the, looking within and analyzing our fellow beings, we come to these qualities of the Godhead. And then obviously the other two, perfection, infinity, derived from those three. And There's something we, important we'll, that so uh, we would diverge on those points. And I think, yes, there is yeah, nothing from the GF that which, which we disagree with. There's nothing. No, 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 we do. No, there is actually. We do, we there, do. There, there is, is there because is, the is. thing is, I mean, you is. see, when you talk about creation, we are not yeah. only talking about those three things. I don't know where you place soul. Would you place it with the consciousness or somewhere else? Ah, that's another big. The bit you missed uh, out. Uh, no, that, that is a big, that's a subject on its own. Well, I, is, I, I, is I, I, that is an important you go, subject, you see, you because like every, I, co every sentient being, I would say, has some sort of a soul or some sort of a life-giving or, or life, uh, some sort of a life, <laughs> which you call... GV or Jiva in your in your in your in your, in your terminology. I clarify for this. Uh, for yeah. this, uh, see the um, in um, the Abrahamic um, theology, you've got nafs, which is akin to in Hebrew it's nefesh or ruach. In Hebrew it's uh, a ruh, ruach. In These Arabic is ruh as well. Yeah. yeah. So the Hebrew and Arabic is obviously linked because they're mm -hmm. Semitic languages. Yes. So, the question is, what is the nature of that nafs? Now, if you take the word nafs, means self as well. No, there is a distinction so between nafs. There is a distinction yeah, between nafs allow and me. Allow yeah. me. So yeah. you're going to say, ana nafsi. I mean, I myself have done this. So in um, when we talk about Atman, Atman is akin to nafs. But it is not a created thing. It is an emanatory thing. So, for example, if you talk about the sun, it consists of photons. So the, the sun consists of billions and trillions and whatever of photons. So each photon is a spark or aspect of the sun. And so each and every nafs, each and every atman is a spark of the divine. So the, it is not that we have a, uh, an Atman. We are the Atman and we have a body. So the body is separate to the Atman. The body is just an encasing, a vehicle that we use comprised mainly of water and calcium, uh, you know, chloride, potassium. So it's do just you make a distinction between Atman and consciousness or do you think it's the same no, thing? Atman, Atman is characterized, the quality or the evidence of an Atma is consciousness. Okay, so is Atman created or it is always existing? Consciousness, Atman is a point of perceptual awareness. That point of perceptual awareness is eternal and it is within the nature of the divine. Okay, so just so where, but I think it's a projection of Brahman. So, you, yeah. so in your vocabulary, yeah. Atman is a projection of Brahman, right? That's what you're saying. Correct. Right. Now, so so obviously, these issues, there is significant difference with Islam, of yeah. course. Oh, because yes. we say, well, I mean, we say there is no equivalent at all between the creator and creation. Right. So anything that is in creation, including the soul, including consciousness, is all created. There is no there is no sense of this spark of the divine within us. We don't believe that. We don't we don't use that terminology at all. No, no, no. So, but again, look, 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 to be to be to be fair, to be fair, uh, we are a reflection of Allah's creation. I mean, we are Allah's creation, right? So, so the signs of Allah can be seen in us and through us. Mm. So, 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 so in that sense, in that sense, yes, I agree. We see a spark. Yeah, we see a spark of God's, uh, let's say, creation. Or we we see a spark of God's existence, let's say, right? As evidence in the creation. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, this is what we believe in. We believe that we are signs of Allah's creation. We are Allah's, uh, like one of Allah's signs. The fact that we exist and the universe exists shows that someone made us. So in that sense, we are that spark that indicates... Uh, the, the existence of a creator and that points to a creator so in that sense it's okay to say that but literally that we are gods uh we are part of god's being and we are part of god this is where we differ this is where we differ right That's we don't we, we, yeah we are we are god is transcendent ultimately truly in all senses 
God does not dwell with us. He doesn't dwell within us. He doesn't dwell in our domain. He has his own domain. He, yeah, sorry. It's Go ahead. God is closer than our jugular vein. Yeah, it's that's in, in knowledge. knowledge. That, that's in, in knowledge. his power, his knowledge. For example, God is close how? Physically? Is he sitting next to me in person? No, we don't believe that. We believe that his approach, his ability, he is so powerful that that he is he, he is closer to us than our jugular veins. He is basically very close to us in his knowledge and his power, his ability, not in person. We don't believe that because when we say he's transcendent, he is beyond us. He's beyond the universe and our domain. We actually mean that. We mean literally he is beyond this universe. We don't believe he dwells, he dwells within the universe or he lives with us. No, we don't believe that. I want, to, I want a clarification from Pandit Rami on what you've just mentioned earlier about the Atma being a projection. So it's not really something distinctly separate from the Paramatma. So, but you mentioned something about the body, though. Body isn't. So, are you saying the body is a creation distinct from the soul, the Paramatma? First of all, I want to um, emphasize again the the separation between Islam and Hinduism is mainly on this issue of creation. Mm -hmm. In Islam, there is a huge emphasis put on God as creator and the act of creation. This is one of your major theological points. For us, mm -hmm. this is irrelevant. We don't care about creation. We don't care about creator. It's For us, it's totally irrelevant, and it is not part of the uh, philosophical or theological debate. You so see, this is, Pandit, uh, this is a very... Eight minutes. So okay, okay. Do it. This, I, this I, is, I want to come. I want to come back to this, but you finish first, please. Go ahead. Go uh, ahead. That is, a, again, a separation between us. The other big difference is imminence and transcendence. So, yes, we say God is transcendent, but at the same time, he is imminent. He pervades every single atom in the universe is pervaded by God. Now, I mean, obviously, we disagree on that, but that is our perspectives, which are, mm -hmm. I mean, they can be reconciled by, you know, to a certain degree, but, um, I mean, we must agree to disagree on that. Uh, so there's no point in uh, saying, you know, who is right and who is wrong on that. These are just different perspectives. So we hold yeah. God to be transcendent. We agree with you. And sorry, I we... just wanted to bring up uh, something which no, is quite sorry, important to this topic. Very quickly, uh, I, I want yeah, you to take up the difference between pantheism and panentheism and also uh, yeah. theism. I think once we understand this graph, then it'll be easier to uh, make some sense to what we are talking yeah. about. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the yes. representation right. for God, go, go on, Panditji, you explain it. It'll be better. That's correct. So God and the universe, that we call as dualism. Uh, pantheism is, um, is, we can say, as monism. And God and the universe, panentheism, is what we would call qualified non-dualism. So we have all these three threads or three streams within um, Hindu philosophy. So which one is the dominant one? Uh, the center, well, panentheism. That the, God is... The, the one on the right, yeah? That God is transcendent, but also... Um, now, the thing is that also within the... Uh, there is a, a, a brand of philosophy called as Mayavada, which says that the world is actually an illusion. It doesn't exist. The only thing that actually exists is God. Brahman. Do you believe in that? Um, no, my view tends towards the, ultimately yes, because everything is uh, God is the again. You you got to look at what the term Brahman means. Brahman simply means the immensity. That's what it means. So it is it is so immense and so unconceivable. And as uh, Mansur Bai said earlier, that you know the finite cannot know the infinite. We can only give approximations. That's why we talk about similitudes. We can only use examples of what we know in the world to describe it. But it's like describing a round object with square words. You can never get it. So no matter what we say, it is just approximations. Language is only a, an approximation, but we cannot actually transmit that knowledge through language. 
the, the, these are the uh, limitations of language. Yeah, well said. Uh, to this point, uh, I think Adnan wants to make a point. It's 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 only fair we allow okay. Adnan by to finish. Gone. Yeah, I wanted to go back to the issue of creation. Where this is where Panditji is saying that we disagree uh, on the importance of creation. But my point is that this is how we get to know God. If we disregard the concept or the very existence of creation or its importance, let's say, uh, to to use uh, a better term. Uh, if we disregard creation's importance, then uh, the concept of Tawheed, oneness of the creator, itself is compromised. This is where Hindus ended up into polytheism. You know, they 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 started worshipping different gods, different deities, albeit minor deities, right? Um, when Hindus went into polytheism, um, this was possibly due to the lack of appreciation of God's oneness his oneness as being as the creator and we can only see him as one when we look at the you know you know, you know uh, how can i put, put it the the unity of idea in his creation when you when you see that there is only one creator through the creation because when we see the design the plan and um, uh, when we look at everything around us we see that this this is all uniform it is all uniform right so when we when we when we see this uniformity it points to one creator and possibly, I mean, I'm just assuming if Hindus, generally speaking, if they ignored the importance of the creation as a sign of the creator, then maybe this is where they went astray into worshipping different deities and ignored the ultimate God, the ultimate creator, the Brahma, uh, you know, to, Brahma. to use the Hindu. Brahman. To use, yeah. Brahman. Yeah. Brahman. Yeah. Brahman. yeah. Is the, so, so Brahma I think at this point, right? it, would be, it would be nice for Pandit Rami to explain yeah. the manifestations of this one into many. Why is this perception? I mean, as far as I know, Gita has very interesting state on this, how the people of less aptitude or knowledge, or the fools rather, they're the ones who would go and focus on these um, idols and so on. So not the knowledgeable ones. I can't remember the exact shloka or, or of the Gita. Yeah. But please explain to us, I mean, how do you have this multiplicity of understanding of deities or, or <laughs> demigods or demigods and what exactly are they? I mean, people have a perception. I just want to clarify this question to the audience. People have a perception that Hinduism is worshipping of many gods, whether it's, you know, Lakshmi, Saraswati, Parvati, Indra, Agni, Shiva, you, you have it, um, Ganesh. What exactly are they? Are they separately divine beings? Are they deities in, in a multiplicity of deities? Please explain to us. Okay, so in the principle of the universe, we see that there's multiplicity within unity. So if you take the example of the body again, the body consists of trillions and billions of cells and different systems. And they all work together to create one. So we are one as a person, but within ourselves, we have a multiplicity. So likewise, in the universe, you have a single universe, single cosmos, but there are multiple systems within that cosmos. So if you talk about the unity of God, absolutely agree, God is a unity, but within that unity, there is a multiplicity. Um, again, this is from our perspective as pan-entheists. We see, we are looking at it. Now, I understand that the Islamic perspective is different, but we're doing the demystifying of Hinduism here. Yes, so yes, yes. Go, go focus ahead. No, on what go the ahead. Hindu position is. So uh, when we talk about the Trinity, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, G, generator, O, operator, D, um, dissolution. So we see that the whole universe is not as a, uh, a, a, again, addressing um, Brother Adnan's issue with creation. We don't believe the world is a creation. It is rather a process. And this is a very, very important um, distinction to make. So Brahma, when you're driving a car, you have acceleration, you've got speed control, and you've got um, braking. These are not different things. These are all part of the same process of driving. If you take the human body, for example, you've got three forces, metabolism, catabolism, anabolism. All of these are different fun functions, but they are one single process. So like that, Brahma is the creative energy of the cosmos. 
Vishnu is the conservative energy of the cosmos. Shiva is the transformative and recreative energy of the cosmos. So these are three aspects of the one Brahman, the, the, the unknown, unknowable, um, inconceivable, absolute essence has three, these three processes within it. And so we see in the universe as well, planets come into being, galaxies come into being, they exist, they disappear, and they're reborn. So this is all part of that cyclic vision of uh, the process. So all these deities that we have are not separate individual beings, sky guys living in the sky, floating on the clouds. They're all aspects of our inner consciousness. And the way that we pass these is when you take the name. Say, take Saraswati, for example. Saraswati is a principle of knowledge. Saraswati means um, that which flows. And so her icon, the, all the icons that you see that you call idols, we call icons, are our graphical user interfaces. So the computer consists of ones and zeros. I can't relate to that. My computer screen consists of icons. I click on an icon and a program opens. And likewise, when you click on these icons of the Hindu deities, they have a whole program behind that that is not recognized. So when you talk about polytheism or, you know, idolatry, you look at a screen, an ignorant person looks at a screen, sees all these icons and says, what is this? But all these icons are relating back to the ones and zeros. It's the way that we interact with the world, the way we interact with um, life and the universe. Hindu mythology, uh, actually mytho all religions have mythologies, not only Hinduism, is Islam, Christianity, you all have your mythology, but you don't call it mythology. Exactly. We don't, we, don't, we don't call it mythology. Exactly. Mythology, yeah. mythology is the content of the uncollect collective unconscious. So any story about gods and demons and heaven and hell and all of this, this is all about the unconscious mind that is coming through. And we give it forms, Nama and Rupa. We give it names and forms and we do create stories and all that kind of thing. So all of this is just merely ways in which we can better understand the ultimate reality. So all these forms, the names and forms are uh, temporary and you need to, the spiritual aspirant who is striving for God realization needs to go beyond all of this and go within. So, so, so Pandiji, I have a question. Uh, no, you know, indeed. A lot, a, lot of, a lot of things you have said are very similar to how the, the, the Arabs, pre-Islamic Arabs, were mm -hmm. arguing with the Prophet. Uh, when the Prophet was telling them about the ultimate God, mm -hmm. the creator, uh, the sustainer, right, whom they called Allah. And when he was talking about the ultimate deity, which is Allah, and mm -hmm. uh, when he was basically criticizing their worship of, let's say, lesser gods, uh, whom they had made up for themselves, he, he was saying that you are actually ignoring and neglecting uh, the, the very creator, the very God who created all of us. Uh, and uh, you're, you're, you're worshipping these idols and these deities you have made up at his expense. So can we not say that about Hinduism, where no. uh, all of these different idols and deities are being worshipped at the expense of the Brahman? Okay. No. No. The, the ultimate. Uh, so no. Are we? Are we not? Okay, okay. Krishna I mean, says. Why, the, the idea if, we, of, if we, if we, if we are worshiping a part, are we? Are we a worship? Are we worshiping the 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 full, the complete? We're not, okay. are we? Okay. Let me explain. So in yeah. the Gita, when Krishna says those of lesser intellect are attached to the worship of the devatas. What he is saying is that if you understand the unity of the whole and you worship a part it's and you understand that this part is a part of the whole, then there's no problem. It's when you start seeing these things as different gods, different uh, perspectives that are separate, and then that is a problem. Now, the, coming back to your point, uh, worship is from an individual to the ultimate. The ultimate, we already said, is all-knowing. So whatever we worship, thinking of the Almighty, the Almighty knows that we are worshiping that alone. So there's no need for me to justify, oh, God, I'm worshiping you. I'm not worshiping this because God knows exactly what I'm worshiping. Now, from an external point of view, when I watch um, uh, Hajj, 
I see Muslims are bowing to the Kaaba. Now, I know as an intellectual person that you are not bowing to the Kaaba itself, the cube, that, but rather to Allah. That is, a, that's a focal point. So in exactly the same way, we use different idols, different icons to connect with that. But when we are bowing to those icons, making offerings to those icons, we are making it to the ultimate Brahman. But, but I'm the, sorry. The, knows that. So there is no again. But I'm, but I'm sorry, there is no comparison between the Hindu worship of idols and deities and Muslim Muslims bowing, bowing to Kaaba because Muslims do not attribute personalities, a will, or even uh, power to change things, let's say, to the Kaaba. We don't attribute those things. Kaaba is simply um, uh, a spot that we all face to worship God, Allah, right? We're not actually we're not actually bowing to kaaba hoping things uh, will happen from the kaaba hindus on the other hand are bowing or worshiping idols hoping for rewards hoping for uh, uh, blessings and all sorts of things for example and they, these gods have personalities they have wills right that may clash with the the will of another person, another deity or personality, uh, right? You know, we, again, so, brother, so we don't, we don't, expect, at, we don't have. You are looking at it from a Disneyland perspective, a completely okay. Disneyland perspective. Yes, okay. I, I know all these arguments, but I am right. a Hindu priest. I worship different deities. I am fully immersed in idol worship. I'm teaching people how to worship idols. If you want to use that, we don't like that term idolatry. It's iconolatry. It is the right. veneration of icons. And I explain to people that this is what the icon represents. And again, you have to understand this. See, there's a lot of complex psychological considerations behind this. But, but Pandit, do you see the difference? Oh, yeah, uh, of course. But do you see the difference between the Kaaba and, let's say, Hanuman? Do you see the no. difference? Do you know what is you the know? difference? in the Hajar al-Ahmar that you have there. It says in the Hadith that this black stone came from paradise and it's going to testify against you on the day of judgment. So this black stone has therefore got consciousness that is going to testify. Not it's true. Divine. Actually, actually our, 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 one of our greatest yeah. one of our greatest teachers, Omar, Omar, he actually looked at the back black stone and he said, you are nothing. You have no value. I would never kiss you if our prophet did not. So the fact that our prophet kiss you, we do not. So in other words, our greatest teachers, our most noble characters made it very clear that these objects have no value of their own. They are nothing. We are only but following that, a discipline. Okay. Again, that is, look, I know, I know that but, theological perspective, Adnan. Yeah. I'm not uh, naive. I but know. The, the, point, <coughs> the point I'm making is there is no comparison between the Kaaba and the Black Stone and Hanuman and, and Hanuman. let's say Ganesh. <coughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Because Hanuman has a personality. Uh, but, Hindus okay. will keep... uh, yeah. Let yeah. me explain. You will keep sure. on overriding me with your Islamic perspective. <laughs> okay, go From ahead. My perspective, we call it the science of symbology. Right. I know the Kaaba is a symbol. I know that. I know when the, the Shias put that uh, clay stone there and they bow down to the clay stone. They're not bowing to the clay stone. That is symbolic. I understand the culture of symbolism. When And for you, if you want to talk about um, idolatry, the Quran itself has become a fetish. No. The Quran itself, people will kill others because they um, they insulted the Quran or even in Bangladesh recently, there was a anti-Hindu riots because it was a Muslim placed the Quran at the feet of a, of the Devi, and ten people were murdered, and there's all those riots. So the yes. Quran itself has become an idol for some Muslims. No, Quran, we don't see that. No, we don't see it that way. We, we, it, is seen, it is seen as a power in itself. There are okay, marriages so where the we Quran don't. We don't, we don't see the Quran as yeah. a physical copy of the Quran has any powers other than the spiritual value it carries. We don't I believe the Quran itself is intrinsic. This is a 
this is a cultural argument, right? right? You right. have a way of eating. Muslims all sit around one plate and eat. We Hindus find that revolting. We only eat separately. These, it's not right or wrong. It's how you deal with your food, with your culture, and using symbology. Idols for us are ritual technology. That is all. It's just a, it's a toys, ritual toys. You've got your toys. You, so, you Pandiji, have... let, let, let me come in here. Let me sort of... Let me sort of wait, uh, wait, wait, just, wait, 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 wait. Let me sort of just clarify one, one point, please. Well, one like, point. I'm just trying to understand. Hanuman, Pandiji, Hanuman. Hanuman. It, wait, 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 wait. Hanuman, is it just a toy or, or is it a real person who has powers to heal and punish? Is uh, th this is what I'm trying to understand? Or, Hanuman or Ganesh? Let's say. Let's... Explain to you, yeah. yeah. Hanuman is a symbol of devotion. Right. right? He's not a real. Symbol. He is a. Um, he is real in terms that devotion is real. Is devotion so, so, real or not? Hang on. I'm... Answer yes or no. Okay. Is wait. Real, is devotion? Are so no. Answer okay. me. Is devotion a real force or is it not a real force? Okay, devotion, uh, when it's directed yes to the right. No, I don't want to uh, just say yes, it is devotion. real or it's not real. Devotion is a feeling, devotion is a feeling which is real, absolutely. Is love a, a, a real force or not? Absolutely. Is hate a real force or not? Absolutely, 100%. Absolutely. And, uh, culturally, what Indians have done, because Indians are very imaginative, so they right. take the force of devotion, and we say, how do we interact with this devotion? So what hmm. we're going to do, we're going to give it a form, and that form is Hanuman, the love, <clears throat> and it represents the love. The whole of the Ramayana is a story, it's mythology about the, uh, uh, the soul's search for God and the unification with God. The whole thing is a spiritual epic. It is not history. There so are you right. saying Hanuman never existed? Hanuman exists absolutely as the principle of devotion, but not as a monkey flying through the sky. No, no, but when you say exist, yeah. do you mean like physically existed or is it just the imagination no. of people? Does, made it clear. Made it clear. Let me come back to the point. Yeah. Does devotion exist as a real force or not? Okay. Let me respond to that very quickly Ashim, because when you say devotion, do you mean ibadah? I think with all three or four of you. No, no, we, we are in agreement. It's just clarification is required in order for us to communicate effectively. So when you say devotion, do you mean ibadah? Devotion, this is not bhakti. Bhakti is different to ibadah. Okay, so that's yeah. why I said we have to clarify because we might be talking cross purposes. So it's very important for us to get the definitions right because earlier you said puja is not ibadah. No. Many many people would consider puja to be ibadah. Yes. Correct. Many Hindus, I mean Hindus, Buddhists, <laughs> Jains, when they go and do puja, they literally are doing ibadah. And you cannot you, deny that. Okay. Well, puja is literally making offerings. Okay. Not only now, that. Come back to no, no, no. Come back to it's a ritual. It's a it's a ritual yeah, it's a of ritual devotion. Of it's a ritualistic, yes. it's a, it's a it ritual of a devotion to, to a deity. But you can't deny that. Right. Hang on. Can, can, I request not, can I request not speaking over each other? Can, can, can I request not speaking over each other? Can I request not speaking over each other? No, I am requesting don't speak over each other because because the audience cannot hear the other person. So one person at a time, please. Okay, let me answer this. Okay, let me answer this. Now, uh, devotion in Sanskrit is called bhakti. Bhakti comes from the Sanskrit root bhaj, which means to share, to participate in what? In the principle of love. So as I said, we have love at the core of our being and God is love absolute. So my love, connecting with the love of God, that is sharing in the nature of the divine. So that is the meaning of bhakti. Ibadah is a separation from God and the servant. You are Abdullah, you are the servant of Allah, and you are uh, showing your ibadah, your respects, your devotion, your honor, etc. So and there's puja, always what a about separation. Puja? That was my question. A minute. Yeah. So there's always a separation between the, the devotee and God in Islam. The two can never meet. 
in Hinduism, the idea with uh, using a, uh, we call it as a pratima or a bimba is a reflection. So the deity that we use, that icon, is a reflection of our higher nature. And the object of puja is ultimately unification with the divine. No, no, not the object, the puja itself. Would you consider puja to be a worship ritual? The actions, is, the actions themselves. Okay, the action of puja is something I do to my mom and dad. I worship them. My guru, I do. But do puja. you do you also I'm worship? Offering. Do you also worship the offer? Uh, sorry, the object that you bring the offerings to, i.e., the idols. It is a well. The idol is a is a kibla. It's a focal point. I want to make an offering, right? I want, to, uh, I want to express my gratitude to God. And I want to take some water, flowers, incense. I want to offer it. Where do I offer it? I can go to a tree. I can go to a rock. I can go to some, some object. Or I can go to an icon, a beautifully sculptured icon, and make the offerings there. I'm not making it to the stone icon per se. I am making it to the God that is represented. Okay. Like in, in England, in your offices, people keep pictures of their families at home, at their home, their wife, children, they keep it on their desks. They look at those and it reminds them of their families. They're not worshipping or um, honouring or venerating the picture per se. It's just something which reminds them of the, their loved ones. No, so but, the, but the thing God, is, in the office, they don't bring food because you and I know God doesn't require food. That's a cultural thing, Bai. That's what I'm trying to tell no, you. But, but Bai, so no, but Bai, if it's a cultural thing, because to me, puja, if it's, a, if it's a worship ritual, then you can't call it cultural only. Because now you are, look, you earlier said that they are not offering it to the idols. They're offering it to God. So the question yeah, still, the question still, one minute, what we are saying is the question still remains. If the if the offering or the puja thali is not for the idol, and then you said it is for God, then the question still remains that God require food. No, it is not. Are bhai, suno to say. I'm waiting for that. Going. What is puja? See, puja is Swadesh Upachara, 16 steps. And it is based on the reception of a guest. So if you, Hashim Bai, come to my house, I will wash your feet. I will, I will wash your feet. I will I'll give you a seat. I will, see, I will offer you something to drink. I will offer you food. I will offer, if you, it's a hot day like in Australia today, I'll give you an opportunity to go and have a shower. All of this is called puja. And then afterwards, after you have eaten, and then I will take my meal after you are satisfied. So this we call as puja. Now, I want to do that to God. How do I do it? I want my culture says that I must do this for God. God is transcendent, as we have said. How do I do it? So what I do is I say, okay, I'm going to make a beautiful image that reminds me of God, and I'm going to make my offerings there. Now, God, as we've already said, is omniscient. He knows. So does he not know that I'm making the offerings to him? It's a gesture of gratitude. Is he oblivious of that? Okay, so basically you're offering food to someone who doesn't eat. Because when you offer me food as a guest, I can understand because yeah. I eat food. But, but what you're doing here is like you're, you're giving sustenance to the, to the one who gives us sustenance. Even uh, symbolically, it doesn't make sense. I'm trying to understand the connection. I'm trying to bring you God as a guest in your house. Okay. <laughs> See, <laughs> treat him can, as can a God, so, oh, so, Can I just come in very quickly? So, yeah, go so let's just sort of say, so, because we're getting a little bit heated. So let's sort of just sort of uh, calm yeah, down. Take a, deep calm breath. Down, yeah. take a deep breath, inshallah. Oh, so, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Just take a deep breath very yeah, quickly because yeah, uh, we're getting too heated. Because I, I really want to have a... A, uh, like sort of a, a calm conversation here. So let me sort of Chant, uh, let, me sort, Chant, let me sort of summarize where we've got to. Let me sort of summarize where we've got to. Yeah, I know. Um, uh, we, we do. Yeah, this has gone. I mean, this has been great, by the way. We do do do. So let me sort of summarize a couple of things. So first thing, I think I, I get your point. Uh, I really, I really understand that from your perspective, looking at it today the idol is seen as a way to remember god not 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 worship directly and i get this however historically from what we've seen over the ages i think it is without question 
groups, sects, individuals have taken those images and actually worshipped them. This is the evidence that we've seen over the years. So I just want to say, because that risk is there, that people will do this, this is one of the reasons that kind of worship of any kind is completely forbidden in Islam. So one of the things Islam does is it, it, it has a fundamental philosophy, which is prevention is better than cure. So therefore we are told, do not associate partners, do not do anything, don't even go near it. Because the risk it. is too high. Because the risk is too high. So first of all, that's that's how we do it. Or that's how you do it. Second thing I would say is I know you're a you're a yoga expert, and I I, I do remember reading somewhere the idea of bhakti yoga, uh, where from what I remember in the teaching, you are specifically asked to choose a specific god or goddess. And you then worship that god or goddess through your entire life with your actions, words, and deeds. Now, for me, that is ibadah. <clears throat> uh, I mean, when you say right. you worship something with actions, words, and deeds, that's ibadah. So right. what I'd like to clarify is, is bhakti yoga something specific for a specific area or group or sect? Or is it something that you follow and is part of Hinduism? And if it is, then really I'm having a difficult time understanding how puja and this bhakti, which is what you also mentioned, how they differ. Because it's, it's far as we're concerned, that actually aligns with Ibadah. Okay, and so first of all, hang on, let me um, answer structurally. So Thank first you. of all, you mentioned risk, the risk of uh, worshipping icons. For us, there is no concept of risk. Because God is love and God accepts, as Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, that whatever you offer me with devotion, I accept that offering. And he also says, whatever aspect of divinity you choose to worship, I know that you are worshipping me alone and I accept your offering and your devotion. All I want is your love. If you show me your love in whatever way it may be, that I will respond to that love. Okay. So for us, there's no... You guys have your Jahannam and uh, Jannat, and uh, if you do this, you'll go to Jannat and Jahan. We don't have that issue. We don't have that concept because God is love, and it is all about participating in that divine love. Now, when we take a deity, we call it an Ishta Devata. So, for example, my Ishta Devata is Vishnu. Mm -hmm. So, I, when I do my daily meditation, I don't do puja per se because, again, it's a structural path. So for simple neophytes, we say use icons. When you go beyond that, we go to the next stage, which is doing japa, which is doing tasbih, you know, do your, recite the names of God. And the final stage and the highest stage is when you give up all of that and you meditate on God within yourself. Now, when you try and meditate on God within yourself, it is very hard to meditate if you try it without focusing on something. So you can either use your breath, you use mantra, or you use rupa. So rupa means you choose a form of God that settles your mind, that contains your mind, to which you can relate in love. So for me, that is Vishnu. So I use the form of Vishnu as a focusing device, but that Vishnu is a projection of my own mind for the purpose of focusing my mind. So it's a focal device. That's what it is. Now, I don't, do, I don't argue, I don't dispute that a lot of common Hindus do see these things in their practical terms because not everybody has got the same level of intelligence and insight and spiritual development. And Hinduism has over 5,000 years of evolution evolved different systems of practice for different people. But we always say that this is the first stage um, worshipping of icons and all that ritual puja is on a lower stage, but the higher stage is meditation, and that's where we want to get you. But also, you guys have one life. You've got 80 years in which to do your stuff and uh, get an eternity in uh, Jannat or an eternity in uh, Jahannam. For us, there are thousands and millions of cycles of reincarnation, so we don't have a rush to go anywhere. We're all eventually going to be reunited with God. That is final. Nobody will ever be separated from God in the end. We all return to the source. 
so, 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 does, does, it, so does that mean so very quickly without that let me just let me finish my thought so does that mean there is there isn't really a concept of sin or righteous acts in hinduism then because if you will eventually get there it doesn't really matter what you do right okay because you will get there summarize i give you a summary so you're all scholars i know you understand sanskrit this is the summary of all the shastras para upakara punya so punya is an act of virtue which means para upakara if you do something you upakara karana evo punya so whatever act you do which benefits another being and contributes to the wealth and happiness and prosperity and joy of another being that is what we call punya papaya para pidanam pida means suffering so to cause suffering to any other being is sin so that is the summary of virtue and sin in in uh, according to dharma shastra that so, whatever act causes suffering to another being that is sin and whatever act causes joy and happiness and benefits another that is virtue what's the moral anchor for that though what, that where is, the where is the moral and ethical anchor how do who so, decide so, so, so when a child is injected uh, with immunization is that an act of virtue no because it's intention what determines a uh, virtue right. and sin is what is your intention so a doctor will take you cut you open and even remove a limb but the intention is to heal you so that is an act of merit but whereas sure. a, uh, a gunda is going to do the same to you it's to uh, extract your cash act of violence Yes. So let's right. let's okay. see, let me come I, back to the I topic a, that we wanted to discuss. Brother, no, 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 I, I have a karma, as we have just come on to this topic of karma. I I, I had something before before we go forward. I had something to clarify very quickly because I don't think we have actually pinned the actual uh, issue here. Uh, my initial concern was that these objects Hindus are worshiping in their millions today in India. Um, you already clarified that they they are they are not real figures they they represent a reality <laughs> they represent devotion rather yes. than re real persons now this is where the problem is now because a lot of hindus and they run into hundreds of millions right they actually take these idols to be literally um real actual beings who have the power to harm and benefit right now this is what we call idolatry we we call it polytheism uh, what 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 has happened here is hindus have left the ultimate creator god almighty and because of these man made scriptures which you have already acknowledged that uh, these scriptures are not necessarily from god himself these are thoughts and perceptions of rishis and their teachings and their philosophies put together right so oft, often contradicting each other and because they're not from god they are contradicting each other what the result the the outcome is that that people now have started worshiping idols and uh, objects that have no origin in reality and they are uh, i mean they are they are expressing their devotion to these idols thinking these idols are actually real persons real beings real gods who existed once upon a time now this is a very adamant on tawhid on worshiping the actual creator who deserves to be worshiped it is okay. his right yes yeah. stop yeah. right there i understand um, we've actually repeated this many times so i don't yeah. want to waste time going over and over we're going around in circles now i've explained to you that when you are worshiping god god is one and god is all pervading if god is all pervading he she it whatever you want to call it is in that idol because yeah. again this is the per, this the, we're coming back to the perspective the point that we made right in the beginning for muslims god is separate from the creation for us god pervades the creation so everything this computer screen i'm sitting in front of god is within the screen i can see four gods sitting in front of me each one of you is a manifestation oh. of god so every so if you say if we in our theology we say god is omniscient and omnipresent and therefore he is in everything and everything therefore becomes an an object through which i can communicate with the totality of being 
That is our position. Obviously, it does not agree with the Islamic point of view. They are poles apart, but we need to agree to disagree on that. No, and then we need to... let's, let's move on. I, I mean, I think clearly, the point is taken. Let's move on. Clearly, the objective yeah. to understand yeah, your perspective exactly. um, here. Thank so you. you touched upon how, you know, the issues are <laughs> endless. We have been two hours. How long, much longer? Oh. How long? Okay, okay. How long um, can you spare with us? So can, can, um, can oh, well, I'll, I'll have to be going soon. Okay, I think it'll be good. To, uh, we probably carry on in a, in another episode. In that's okay. Maybe we should do a part two, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This has been fantastic, like by the way. This has been, this has been a brilliant discussion, by the way. Yeah. But, but Hind it, uh, Hinduism like is a vast to, topic. Like we know that it's not something that we can do it over. We learned a lot. Yeah. We learned a lot today from Pandiji, and respectfully. Uh, we appreciate your contribution and your participation. It was an amazing discussion. And we, we need more like these so that, you know, confusion can be, can, be, can be dealt with. People can get to know what Hindus actually believe and what Muslims actually believe, right? And this can only happen when we have friendly interactions like this. So we really appreciate your participation, Pandit. So, yeah. so the, 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 here's what I suggest. Let's ask one more question to Panditji, and then maybe we'll open the lines very quickly and just have sort of five or ten minutes of audience Q and A. Would that would that be fair? Okay. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So so brother Mansur, go, go ahead. And the question, I mean, this is not going to be fair to ask a question which doesn't have enough time to to elaborate. I was going to ask about the whole issues of karma. And reincarnation. I think yeah, these are it's long we leave that. Okay. We leave yeah. that for uh, <laughs> second session. If Pandit uh, Rami is willing to um, come and join us again, so let's uh, open up our Q and A. Yeah, um, let's, do that. let's go straight to Q and A then. In that case, yeah. straight away, because actually, yes, time went so fast in in a discussion like this. Um, mm -hmm. I appreciate um, Pandit Rami staying beyond what we agreed already. We said it's going to be about ninety minutes, and then Q and A. Yeah. So, <coughs> Do you have the link? Already? If you want, if you want to grab another Irish coffee, go ahead. Uh, we'll, we'll wait for you. While people are joining, can I just yeah. um, get a clarification? I mean, I'm not asking you a question. Just a clarification from Pandit. Um, you mentioned about Vishnu, Shiva. Are you suggesting these are some kind of, you said, aspect of the ultimate one? Yes. So this is similar. Is this akin to modalism where... It's like a different perspective of the wand. But Trinity in, in Christianity, for example, we know the modalists um, are considered to be heretical in the sense that, okay, they consider the, the one has three different representations, but Jack <clears throat> not three. But in the orthodox traditions of Christianity, in Trinitarian Christianity, there are three distinct persons or hypostases. In your understanding of this Trimutri or Trinity you mentioned about Vishnu, Shiva, um, and who's the other one? Um, Brahma. 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 Brahma, are they aspects of the one or are they three distinct entities or whatever you want to describe? That's what I, the uh, similitude that I used was of the body, um, metas um, um, anabolism, that... catabolism and metabolism. So metabolism is the balancing up of the body to create homeostasis. Catabolism is a breaking down of tissue. <clears throat> anabolism is a building up of tissue. But all three are the aspects of the same uh, physiological dynamic. They are not different. So when we talk about the creation or the uh, projection of the universe, um, and it's a process, as I said. So we talk about Brahma. So Brahma didn't create the world. The world is an ongoing process of, of coming into being. And then Vishnu is the, that energy which maintains the homeostasis of the universe. And that same energy transforms into Shiva to bring about a transformation and recreation. So it is the same energetic force in three different aspects. And this brings us to the concept of the gunas. We say that the entire material nature has three gunas, three qualities of, um, of sattva, rajas, tamas. So sattva is balance, rajas is energy creation, um, and tamas is uh, degeneration, disintegration. Thank so you. you have to see this as a process, not Thank as you. separate deities. Thank you for the clarification. We've got lots of people uh, joining in. Let's bring um, a guest. Who do so we have? Just for the audience, can you could you please yeah. keep it to one question only, please, and yeah. response? Uh, we want to get through this. <laughs> Thank you. And answer. Slow, 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 slow. And uh, uh, namaste to Swami. 
Uh, it's uh, uh, a privilege to be asking you a question. Uh, you. I was fascinated by what I was uh, hearing. Um, you know, I am quite fortunate that I actually can uh, read uh, Sanskrit and I can uh, basically draw parallels with uh, Avastan, which is early, early Persian. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm also familiar with the fact that a lot of the you know, theological concepts that today form what is broadly described as Hinduism uh, originated a lot earlier. I, I quite agree with you. 5,000 years is a pretty good uh, estimate. But uh, modern Hinduism and even the word Hindu is first used in context of a religious identity by Raja Ram Mohan Roy. And uh, <clears throat> my perspective is slightly different, right? It's, uh, would you agree that uh, Hinduism essentially precedes the scientific method and the you know, empirical uh, method in trying to actually explain the universe and the world we live in? And uh, when one listens to a lot of what are religious concepts, they are essentially trying to describe the natural world we are living in. You know, you talk about the life energy, right? You know, you're, you're talking about different manifestations, the fact that we all understand that pretty much all living matter has certain amount of life force, whether you want to call it a soul, even uh, plants and so on. Uh, they exhibit a uh, lot of characteristics that uh, are required for what we define as life. And this is why often, you know, the debate about the viruses themselves, right? Are they alive or are they just, uh, you know, basically molecular, molecular particles or, uh, you know. So uh, I tend to look at Hinduism more in context of 5,000 years of essentially, you know, science. You know, I wouldn't call it pseudoscience because a lot of the, that thought that went into it is quite commendable and in fact makes a lot of sense. If you do not have uh, access to scientific uh, experimentation and so forth, you are going to try to come up with a model of the world you live in. So where do you put it, right? I, I'm, I'm looking at it just as an outsider and I don't tend to look at Hinduism just purely as a religious philosophy. And in, in fact, I don't even look at it as a single you know, religion or a way of life. I think there's such huge diversity in what are known as Hindus across uh, the subcontinent and even, you know, as far as uh, Central Asia, because that's where it originated from, more or less, the ideas and the concepts. Sure, brother. I mean, can you focus your question now for Pandit Ram? So the, the, the question is, do you regard Hinduism as a faith or do you regard it as basically a theoretical framework for, you know, explaining what the universe and life is? <clears throat> the best way to explain Hinduism is it's an open system of investigation. And it's a brotherhood of not believers, but a brotherhood of seekers. So um, right from the beginning, when you go back to the Vedas, they, they're, their rishis are asking questions. What is that? By knowing which, everything becomes known. So they were looking for a, a, a theory of everything. And um, this was the, their investigation. So they developed the systems of Vaisheshika, Nyaya. Nyaya is a system of logic. And they said the only way we can approach this is through empiricism and logic. <clears throat> and then they developed the whole system of debate and argument to try and discern the truth. Because how do we find out the truth? It's through dialogue. It is through this type of dialogue that we can we have real conversations and we, we test each other's theories. And this was the whole concept of debate and argument within Hinduism, where different schools used to when you formed a, uh, a theory of everything, you would then go out and challenge other schools and other philosophers to debate with you in public to discover if your theory stands up to rigorous criticism. And uh, knowing Sanskrit, there is a, uh, a nyaya. We say, stuna um, kanana nyaya. So it is the logic of establishing a pole. So when you want to uh, establish a pole, you dig a hole, you put uh, the pole in, you pack your stones around, you pour in your concrete, and then you shake the pole to make sure that it's firm and stable. And like that, where you have a theory, a theological, philosophical theory, you test it by uh, getting other people to criticize it. And then you learn to hone those skills. So Hinduism is an evolving, developing system of thought.
it's an open system everybody can come and put their ideas in. it is not god derived but it is god centered uh, it 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 seems that uh, you know what i i had inferred is pretty much what you are confirming because it's uh, essentially you know precedes the scientific method in terms of experimentation and so on so what they had available to them is obviously logic you know scholastic method socratic method where they are debating and evolving and refining their yeah. uh, you know understanding you, you you know you were referring to uh, basically the vedas and so on and uh, when you're reciting them i can pretty much pick up most of the word like sutun right which is shared with farsi or yeah. avestan and so on and this would, again leads me back to the fact right that this 5000 years of evolution is more of a civilizational and scientific evolution rather than necessarily just a purely theological one and when it comes to the concept of god right which is, seems to be you know a large part of uh, what the, this debate was i am still fascinated that uh, you know i i quite agree right it's got a very different different interpretation of what you what the muslims or the monotheistic faith faith regard as god right so i i i think we can agree to disagree that uh, the you know hindu model hindu civilizational model is a lot more complex and not necessarily you know accessible to you know ordinary person who doesn't want to delve too deeply into philosophical concepts thank you for your time you're welcome thank you for joining us question thank you brother i just, just have a quick comment on that and uh, thank you for brother abit for that uh, that clarification uh, you see what what we what we're seeing here is on the one hand we have human endeavor to reach uh, an understanding of the universe and the cosmos and uh, generally um, uh, the sense of being you know uh, what being is in general okay that's what you have described in terms of th that 5000 years of hard hard work of uh, rishis philosophers thinkers and intellectuals on the other hand we have a system where god basically reveals uh, his uh his teachings his uh his instructions and his view of the universe so this is where the difference is i think the major difference is on the one hand we have human endeavor human struggle human uh, hard work in uh, understanding the universe on the other hand we have god revealing to us as to what he wants and who he is basically this is how i think We see it. I mean, our counter argument to that would be: How do you know that Muhammad was the messenger of God, and that Allah actually uh, revealed the message to him? And then Excellent you will say, question. "You will Excellent say, question. and we can do a whole different yeah. program on that." Yeah, then you <laughs> say, the Quran tells us. So, who, how do you know the Quran is the word of God? Because and, and Muhammad. We can answer that as well. So you get onto a circular argument, yeah. which uh, we has no resolution. We can have Pandit Ji in a program where we discuss. the divine yeah. origins of the quran yeah. and the truth of the prophet muhammad whether he was actually a prophet yes. of god or not it would yeah. be nice to have uh, the pandit ji you know to be in a program like that where we That's can actually fine. address these questions inshallah okay. thank you both i, I want to get some more more, more guests in and please can i have a guest you Did know short, ask some please, questions and very briefly one and... question please yeah yeah okay brother altan is here you need brother, to where are you in the dungeon <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's in bed i think or, or, or uh, you need to unmute yourself and please state where you're from and your question oh yeah hi there can you hear me okay now we yeah. can hear you altan yes loud and clear great fantastic uh, uh thanks for the stream so far guys i'm really enjoying it so um yeah learning a lot to well, just um um so in in there was like i don't know We're losing you. We can't hear you your, properly. Your voice is cutting out, Alton. Are you on yeah. Wi-Fi? Your Wi-Fi signal is very weak. But then, what what happens to the bad souls? What happens to the bad souls? Like, where do the bad souls go? Like, in in Islam, we believe in free will. We believe that if you're bad, you know, you end up going to hell, heaven, etc. So, what's the concept in Hinduism then? Because what, where, so, so, where does all the bad souls go? If that sure. makes sense. I think um Pandit got a question. Go ahead. Great question. I, Thank you brother Alton. I think we will need to defer that to the discussion on karma and reincarnation okay. because that is a whole complex issue that it can't Correct. be dealt with. Yeah. So we'll, 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 we'll come back to it. 
That's fine. So okay. leave, let's leave this question and thank you for coming and joining us. Um, Assalamu alaikum. Brother. Um, who's next? Someone? Um, brother, um, yeah, oh, Tatiana. We... Oh, oh Tatiana. I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> Sister Tatiana, if you want to switch off the camera, you can do. Gosh, yeah, this is amazing. I'm so sorry. Yes. Yeah, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, well, I'm so thankful to be able to, to see all of you. Uh, upper Mansur's, um, you know, request. I am uh, turning on my camera, uh, and I think it's uh, only logical to do that. Um, I just wanted to say, first and foremost, you all do such an amazing job when you talk to people. It's just fantastic to see all of you. Um, and uh, I have j just one question. It, and actually, my question is, um, what is your favorite surat from the Quran and why? Uh, Faisal's question, actually from the chat, he wants to know what is your favorite food. So I just have to ask that. But <laughs> is this question to Pandit Rami? From all of, for all of you, for all of you. Okay. <laughs> for all of us. Thank you. Yeah, so, so, so for me, Let's Surah Rahman. Pandit Rami first. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah. So we'll start with your, well, you know mine, Surah Rahman. So, <laughs> Rami, do, do you have a so do you do you have because you spent time in 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 our I land. Think that to you to you you believe what i do not believe i believe what you do not believe to you your religion to me Surat -Kafirun. Yeah. Surat -Kafirun. very good and, that's a good choice and, that's a very good choice and mine is mine is uh the very surah right next to it uh surah 112 surah al-ikhlas which is basically say god is one he is absolute and uh, uh, he did not beget anyone. He was not begotten, and there's no like him. One heart. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. There you go. Pandiji knows it. Absolutely. Very good. Very good. Yeah. Brother Mansur, brother um, Hashim. Can we? Mine is um, uh, Surah Al-Fatiha, the opening. <gasps> that, okay, that's one of my favorites. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. That's why it's put at the start of the Quran, you know? Yes, 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 yes. Absolutely. Was that a revelation from Allah or was it a statement of the Prophet? The whole of the Quran is a revelation from Allah. The whole of the Quran. But why is Allah praising himself? Why is he talking to himself? Because he's amazing. He's teaching. He's, he's, teaching, he's teaching humans how to pray to him. This is what, and, and, and we, we have been told that this surah, Basically, half of it belongs to God Almighty. Basically, we, uh -huh. uh, we, we, we are asking God. God is teaching us how to ask Him, how to pray to Him. So that's what the surah is. The opening is we are praising God in the first half. And in the second half, we are asking Him uh, for, for certain things. So this is God teaching us how to pray to Him. Basically, that's what it is. Yes. Sister Tatiana, uh, um, you yes. ask a very interesting question. Are you are you Muslim or are you thinking of becoming Muslim? I'm actually, uh, fortunately, a Muslim, a new Muslim, but yeah, I am. I'm Alhamdulillah. Thank Alhamdulillah. You. That's yeah. so nice to see you. Yeah. And mashallah, thank you for joining us. And uh, did you have a any other question for us? <clears throat> well, Faisal does. He wants to know what's your favorite. What's everyone's your favorite food? So can we Faisal. leave that to another discussion, perhaps? Yeah, yeah. I know. I know. Yeah, I want to. Thank you for I, I have. I have a long list, so <laughs> yeah, yeah. yes. <laughs> you. Okay. Thank you so much. A few menus of a few yeah. restaurants, yeah. <laughs> Jazakallah khairan. Jazakallah khairan. Thank, thank you for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Wa alaikum salam. Right. Okay, so, so got, brother uh, uh, Nabil, uh, Nabil, very quickly, yes, yeah. please. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. we can, brother Nabil. Yeah. 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 Uh, thank you for joining. All, uh, yeah. Uh, thank you. First of all, I'd like to, uh, you know, congratulate you for this conversation, uh, doing a wonderful job. Uh, I have a question for Pandit Ji. Um, I like to know uh, there is in Islam there is a concept of you know there is a beginning and there is a there will be an end. And mm -hmm. I wanted to know what's in the Hinduism and if it's in the like a circle and there will be no ending and beginning. It's like a unreal infinity kind of a concept. If I'm I might be wrong. Can you please shed some light on it? Okay, this again, the major part of this discussion will have to reserve to karma and reincarnation. All right, I see. Because that's tied in with that. But the concept generally is of time cycles within cycles. And uh, there is actually a beautiful description in the Shastra. It says, if you want to know how long we have been taking birth, there is a mountain. And every hundred years, a bird comes and sharpens its beak on the mountain. 
the time that it takes to reduce the mountain to rubble, that is the time that we have been incarnating and moving through the samsara. So, uh, but in ultimate sense, God is beyond time. So in, in the, the, the world of the divinity, there is no time. Time only applies to us here in the material yeah. world. Right. Okay. I hope that answers your question and inshallah join in next time. Tune in. Inshallah. When Thank you, you will you. Um, elaborate in, in more depth. Yeah. Thank you. I think, Thank you. I think on, on that note, we will end here because Panditji has to go, I think, as well. And so do yes. I and and uh, maybe others. Uh, if you if you brothers uh, want to continue, uh, yeah, so we got take only you. one more guest uh, whom we'll let in because he's been waiting for quite a while. It'll be unfair. So last guest, okay. Panditji, and after that uh, we carry on next time. We'll close that session. Thank you, brother Mod. Uh, namaste. Go on. Uh, namaste. Namaste. Oh. Panditji. This this guest, all discussions with him are, are an hour, or one hour long. No, no, okay, you need, I know to, you need to keep no, no. your question yes, very yes, brief. Adnan, don't be so. Uh, you know, <laughs> no, no, we'll give you time uh, to them. Go on, please. just yes. make it brief. Please. Yeah, yeah. Oh, brother Amor, ask your question, please. Ask your question, yeah, please. please. Hachim, Hachim, and we're going to close the, the, the session, for please. The no more guests. Yeah. Uh, Hachim kept the best he's, for the He's last. been waiting what? since the start, so it's only fair yeah, to give him a chance. So three hours I have been waiting. Adnan, please be merciful to me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, see, what is uh, discussion? Uh, here we saw that. Uh, the Islamic concept is dual impersonalism. God is impersonal, but the soul is different. And here we have our uh, esteemed guest, Panjit Panditji. Uh, he uh, talks about Ramanujacharya's uh, Vishishta Advaitva, that is qualified impersonalism. So he basically uh, thinks that God is impersonal. But then as we see, he must be knowing about Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. He brought this uh, Achinta Bheda Bheda that there is that there is uh, same but difference also. Mm. So what is same? Uh, same in the quality, that is Satchitananda, but difference in the quantity, that is we are infinitesimal and God is in, infinite. And then yeah. another another thing, as you said, that you th say that Puranas are mythology, that I Correct. disagree. Uh, Shruti no, Shruti Purana I no, 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 no. It cannot be deleted because it, it is, is a disturbance in the uh, devotion to Lord Hari. Shruti Smruti Purana Adi Pancharatriki Vidhim Vina Aikantiki Hare Bhakti Utpadeva Kalpate. Rup Goswami says this. So you cannot say that Puranas no, are uh, mythology. Uh, there is a difference in the uh, this opinion. So I would like to uh, uh, ask your opinion about, you must be knowing about Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the Achinta Bheda Bheda. I know all expert. about, uh, huh? we have refuted it. Ramanuj has refuted all of this Chinta Bheda Bheda. <laughs> okay. And this completely. Okay. I said you are a Dwaitis. You are huh? complete Dwaitis. So, so just for the audience, huh? just for the audience. Heretic. Uh, you know, yeah, no, 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 hold on, hold on. Uh, but no, 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 okay, Ram, you cannot have it both ways. You said there is yeah. no heresy in Hinduism, so you can't <laughs> no, have it both ways. <laughs> no, 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 okay, 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 so it's calm, okay, okay, so let me clarify. So, Brother Ahmad, can you explain just for the audience <clears throat> what kind of Hindu you are versus uh -huh. what kind of Hindu um, Panditji is? Huh. So now, so we now we have, have, a, Shia, we have a... a Shia Hindu and a Sunni Hindu, right? <laughs> <laughs> kind so, of yeah. go ahead with how much yeah, yeah, like, he believes yeah. that brahman is ultimate impersonal brahman yes. okay and i am a bhakta i say krishna yeah. krishna stu bhagwan swayam but ah. he uh, uh he narayana stu bhagwan huh? narayana stu bhagwan and that narayan is krishna uh, I, uh, okay. yeah, I, have a, <laughs> I have a question which uh, which one of you Nirvikalpa. Which one of which one of you is Wahhabi? Another question uh, another thing is that institutionalization. See in Islam there is a heavy institutionalization. So you cannot go beyond the institutional set of belief. But yeah. Hinduism is more open uh, and yeah, you open yourself system. can become an institution. Yes. He agrees so with you. Why? Why is uh, Islam so institutionalized that it is? Are you asking Pandit Rami that question of... or not? Hmm? Whom is that question for? Who is the question for, Brother Ramad? <laughs> no, 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 no,
that uh, Hinduism is more open, more accommodative. That's why you you. Because it was I'll tell you to... something that the yes. strength of Islam is in the concept of the Ummah. That is the concept because it comes from the Tawheed. There is one uh, final prophet, and uh, you have the Ummah, and the Ummah is the strength of Islam because there is equality in the Ummah, and that same Ummah created the greatest um, uh, conquest of the world from Spain to India. But that was political, not spiritual. That doesn't, it was all linked up. Yeah. But the yeah, point that is, is, what that is the problem? Ummah, that the political... The problem culture... is that you Hindus have got so much caste and creed and sect and bet and... You, no, but that's why... There's no Chaitanya... unity amongst you Hindus. <laughs> no, no. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, that's why. The soul is not a Hin uh, Brahmin or Vai Vaish or a Kshatriya. Yeah. The body is a body ha, uh, is born with some qualities. So, so the soul is never discriminated. Body is not born with any qualities. Yeah, the body comes from your mother and your father. They had sex that no, produced no, no, your no, body. There's no, no qualities no. other than your what genetic Bhagavad Gita, In Bhagavad Gita, what Krishna says that uh, Chatur Varina Maya Srishtim Guna Karma no, Vibhadisha. Jeeva Loke, no. Jeeva Bhuta Sanatana. Uh, that is about the soul. That is about the yes. soul, not the body. That is about soul the soul. Soul and body are different. That he is a Jeeva, is a soul. But body is born with qualities. That's why we have different bodies. We don't no, have a same body. Are, hmm? The qualities are come from your genetic. <laughs> no, no, brother Ahmad, one, one question for you. One question for you. So you, you said you follow Lord Krishna. Yeah. Yes. Now, Panditji earlier said Krishna is simply a manifestation of Brahman, right? So he doesn't believe Krishna is real. Yeah. For you, we believe is Krishna believe real? Krishna is a source of Brahman, just like the sunlight. The no, the <laughs> no, you are saying <laughs> impersonalism <laughs> is atheism. Impersonalism Krishna. is atheism. What Shankaracharya said. Brother Amor. Yeah. <laughs> where is Krishna mentioned in uh, Rig Veda or Upanishads? Hari Om. The, uh, every mantra starts with Hari Om. Hari, Hari is Vishnu, Shukta starts Krishna. with Hari Om. Who is that Hari then? Hari is Vishnu, not Krishna. <laughs> yeah, Krishna, you're Vishnu, the wrong yeah, Vishnu, <laughs> but the origin of Vishnu is also Krishna because no, in Brahman, Bhagavatam, yes. in Srimad Bhagavatam, Krishna is not mentioned. Bhagavatam is written in the 16th century. No, 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 no. Bhagavatam guys, okay, gentlemen, 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 guys, guys, I don't think we're going to get a closure here. Listen, listen, why don't you leave? Yes. Why don't you leave all this confusion? And yeah, come okay. to the okay. just join Islam. Just, okay. just join Islam. It's easy. Uh, in conclusion, okay. I will tell you, I am. Uh, there are a sect of Hindus, uh, majority, who those who follow devotional bhakti path, especially yes. of Chaitanya yeah. Mahaprabhu. And not majority or minority. <laughs> you are Islam. <laughs> <strong. laughs> yeah. And then so, there so are gentlemen, impersonalists. Okay, okay, Brother Ahmad, please. Yeah. So. I think for the in the interest of time, because yeah. Panditji has been yeah. very, very generous with his time. Okay, okay, yes. In fact, we've, we've overstayed significantly. <laughs> and I appreciate you joining as well. Uh, what we'd like to do is, you are the last caller. Thank you very much for joining. I think we're going to now, let's go to close. And Brother Mansoor, Brother Hashim, if you want to play, please close out the session now. With no more guests. We do apologize. Yeah. So no more guests. Okay. Um, so Guys who are joining, you can you please um, stop joining? Uh, thank you, Brother Rama. Thank you for joining. And do join us on a new stream because Pandit Ji has said next he will do another stream with us. I think Adnan Bhai, Adnan Bhai has to go, so let's um, give yes. him the opportunity, inshallah. Pandit Ji, thank you, Brother Rama. My, my pleasure, my pleasure being with you. Thank you so much. And I look forward to uh, another another interaction if possible. Thank you so much, Pandit Ji. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, Brother Adnan. Assalamu alaikum. Brother Mansoor. No, I think um, let's hear the last few words <laughs> from um, Pandit Rami um, because it's been a very long stream. I think we we're going to make it very short. So please um, go ahead. Your, your last few thoughts. If you'd like to summarize your thoughts, please. Just from yeah. what we discussed. Um, it was very, very interesting and uh, I enjoyed it. But um, I think we need to restrain Brother Adnan. He's, uh, he's very overpowering and uh, he's uh, very dynamic. And so, you know, it kind of, it becomes overwhelming. So we, we, I think we need to, um, uh, I think Brother Mansoor is, is better at uh, directing the conversation. 
we'll, we'll, I'm sure you love Brother Atnan. Yeah, yeah, you will love you will love him very much when you get to see. No, him. No, I do, but it you know it becomes overwhelming because I'm um, you know dealing with like questions with you three, yeah. and then uh, Brother Adnan is is very you know he's very knowledgeable and uh, very firm in his opinions, and so it becomes difficult to negotiate. So, in terms of the topics we discussed today, would you like to maybe give any last words just to, just to wrap up the topics that we covered, and and where where you want to leave it in terms of the next session that we want to get to. Well, I mean, I think we covered everything that we need to in terms of uh, the nature of the divine. And we've uh, identified points of uh, uh, cohesion, overlap. We've also identified points of difference that uh, cannot be reconciled um, in view of our different theologies. And um, on those points, we, we need to agree on what we agree on and uh, ex- and agree to disagree on those which we cannot reconcile. So um, that topic has been covered. So I think in the next um, sessions, we should rather move on to other topics like the self. I mean, the nature of the soul, for example. Yes. And that can come into the, we can talk about, you know, the ultimate goal of life. What is the ultimate goal of life? Is it to go to heaven or is it moksha or, uh, karma and reincarnation, that's something that we can deal with as well. So I think we need to be more focused and uh, two and a half hours is like, uh, it's a, a bit too much. No, to absolutely speak. right. Fantastic. We really no, no, appreciate no, no. Thank your you so time much, yeah. and your effort. But uh, as I said uh, during the stream as well, Hinduism is a vast topic and you know it. Uh, even two and a half hours, not even scratch the surface, I would say. Okay, so it's uh, and, and as Brother Amod uh, showed you, there are disputes within Hinduism. Oh, yeah. <coughs> definitely, like every religion, you know, there are people who agree and disagree. Yeah. Uh, but then it's it's good to learn through this uh, kind of medium where we bring on um, people like you who are learned in your faith. So it's not just Muslims discussing about Hinduism. We want the Hindus to portray their religion and their faith from their scriptures or from their um, gurus or from their from the right. sources. And this is one of the, uh, what do you say, one of the objectives of this particular uh, stream and uh, actually the series of uh, episodes on Hinduism. Because Hinduism, I mean, there are like, what, a billion Hindus out there? And even though the Muslims live next to the Hindus in India, I would say very few, few people actually understand. Um, and as you correctly said, during your during the stream that uh, very few Hindus actually know about their religion. Many of them don't read the Shastras, can't even read it because they don't even know Sanskrit. And um, correct me if I'm wrong, this is like the majority of the Hindus, I would say. That's true. That's what I said to you again previously. Uh, the vast majority of Hindus are ignorant of the, even these basic principles that we've been discussing today. The vast majority of Hindus would never have um, encountered them. Okay, so let's use this medium to not only teach the Muslims, but also the Hindus. There seems to be a lot of interest in karma and reincarnation coming up. <laughs> yeah. Well, good. Well, and we will get topic suggestions for the next session as well. Thank you very much, yeah. Brother Hashim. Well, thanks uh, a lot, Lama, everyone. Any last words from your side? No, no think... let's end today. It's been yeah. enough um, yeah. overstretching the topic. So I'm just going to end this formally. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Ashadu wa la ilaha illa ant. Was